Now, everyone, welcome to the April 22nd Select Board meeting. This meeting is called to order at 6.30 p.m. And per usual, we start our meeting with public comment. Does anyone have any public comment to offer this evening? Please come forward. Out for precinct one. Um, I believe this evening you're going to be considering the articles 31, 32, and 33. Um, and I would like to comment on those. And um, I'd like first to say that these are attempts to rezone North, Am North Amherst again. And I believe, Mr. Musante, you said at the end of the last town meeting that there'd be no more rezoning of the villages until we had a housing market survey, which we've been waiting for in the hope that it would, in fact, identify places in the town that were suitable for densification for student housing. Um, we don't have that, and um, we were told in February that North Amherst was not going to be um, rezoned. Um, and was taken off the, the agenda and reappeared in these articles in uh, late February, I think, maybe early March. We have not had time to either understand the implications and the um, impact that these articles are going to have on our neighborhood. Um, I've tried to get information from the planning board about the number of residential units that could be um, placed on the com property now uh, with the new dimensions and um, so forth. <coughs> and they're unable to do so. And I think given that fact that we can't have a, a reasonable idea of what is going to occur there, um, that these are not ready for public um, discernment as to their appropriateness for the area. The, when the other two um, efforts at rezoning were made, the COM was, we were told, was not appropriate for a village center, and so they were wanted to rezone it. The thing is that that is not the village center. Um, the village center lies south of the river, where the post office, the library, the bank, the pizza house, the laundry, all of those few amenities lie south of the river. And north of the river is actually connected to the rural part of the town, uh, well, the rural area beyond it, and it's RN up Montague Road. So I know you're anxious to densify in the village centers, and we would welcome density in our village center south of the Mill River. We do not welcome it north of the river, especially when we can't learn what effect that's going to have on traffic, noise, a number of occupants. Um, it all seems <coughs> to be um, unable to be determined at this point. So I don't think it's ready for our discernment. And I would ask you not to rubber stamp this um, these three articles that relate to our neighborhood. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to make public comment this evening? All right, then we will deal with a couple of untimed items before we get to our 645 timed item. Uh, let's see, the first one is the to extend the land development agreement with HAP for Olympia Oaks. We talked about this at our last meeting. This is kind of a technicality that we have to go through to keep the process moving with Olympia Oaks. I have to ask folks if conversations could happen in the hallway, please. Excuse me, conversations need to happen in the hallway, not during our meeting. Okay, so uh, the land development agreement with uh, HAP uh, for Olympia Oaks. So this is, as I said, a technicality. Um, Ms. Stein, would you like to read the motion? Sure. I move that the select board authorize the extension of the land development agreement between the town and HAP <coughs> Incorporated 
from June 30th, 2013 to August 30th, 2013 to allow parties additional time to satisfy the preconditions to entering into the lease for the Olympia Drive property. Second. For the discussion. Ms. Brewer. I just wanted to reassure the public that nothing has gone um, wrong in this process. It's simply a delay, you know, uh, as is very typical in uh, as the processing happens at the various different state agencies. So things are proceeding apace. We just need a little extra time on this particular mm -hmm. aspect of the agreement. Yep. Thank you. Other uh, further comment? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. All right, next up we have the uh, announce the DCR <coughs> interest in Southeast Street property acquisition and consider request to reduce notice period. Um, so this is information in our packets. This is also a technicality. Essentially, because the state is interested in potentially acquiring the land on Southeast Street that is um, one of the articles on our town meeting warrant, they need to make that um, uh, that announcement needs to be made in public <coughs> by the select board. Uh, and they have also requested a waiver or a shortening of the 120 day um, requirement period for, uh, for their notice. Um, this is something that we have dealt with before. Uh, it typically we just say, yes, fine, no problem. There was one time recently when the state was interested in a property on Fearing Street and we opted not to approve the shortening of the notice period because we didn't have enough clarity on the information. Um, so that was a, uh, there was a lot of concern about what was going on with that property. So we did not uh, agree to shorten the waiver period. Um, at this point, I think really it just is a technicality. I don't know if anyone would have any concerns about this, but um, I think that uh, I, I think that considering that this whole thing is moving forward with a with a deliberative process through town meeting, that there's not any reason for us to oppose it. Mr. Hayden, yeah, the um, please speak into your mic. The material that we have didn't include a minimum time for notifications. It, it, it's asking us to relax the the maximum time, but it doesn't doesn't give us any idea of what how far they want to be relaxed. Is it 36 hours or is it four days? Uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't have a real problem with that, but it just seems to me a deficiency in what we're being asked to uh, Okay, to Mr. Act Zomek, is that anything you can speak to? I was sort of assuming that the notice period essentially starts now and goes till whenever it needs to go. Yes, that's actually correct. So just to slightly modify something um, Ms. O'Keefe said, this, uh, the state has to do this anytime they're expressing an interest in purchasing any interest in land, whether it be fee interest or purchasing a development rights. In this case, uh, as you may recall, and, and in the lead up to town meeting, this will be well <coughs> articulated, but the CPAC is moving forward under the assumption that um, the Kestrel Land Trust, the town, if town meeting votes to approve funds from the CPA, and the state through DCR and private funding will all come together to purchase that seven plus or minus acres off of Southeast Street. So the state is essentially saying we need time before a um, summer closing and it would be beneficial for the state to say the clock starts now. So there is no minimum because they would like it to start if you're so inclined to vote on it now to have the state clock start essentially now and so they can proceed with their due diligence. All right, so does that answer your question? So that it doesn't, the clock doesn't stop until <laughs> whenever it needs to We're stop. We're not waiting four months for it to start. We're starting it now. Okay, correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Because if all goes well, there would be a summer closing and they need to start their process now, not 120 days from now. Ms. Brewer. I just wanted to verify my understanding that although this is all supposed to come together in a piece, <coughs> that by us voting this, and even though it says hereby approves the acquisition, this does not tie our hands associated with the town meeting article. And whether the select board recommends or doesn't recommend the town meeting article and town meeting recommends or doesn't recommend payment, th this can proceed irrespective of that. And it's not like DCR is going to come back to us and say, uh-uh, uh, uh you said. Um, this is just a separate piece that they have to go yeah, through. Yeah, it's a separate piece, that a formality that they have to go through to notice the town. But whatever vote the select board takes uh, or town meeting takes is a um, separate track. Right. Thank Related you. but separate. Right. And so I, I can just uh, 
quickly read the paragraphs in the letter so that it's a nice and official um, announcement. Keeping with the provisions of 301 CMR 51.00, we'd like to inform you that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts acting through its Department of Conservation and Recreation, DCR, has under consideration the acquisition of approximately 5.44 plus or minus acres of land or other property interest therein in the town of Amherst. The property is currently used as undeveloped, unmanaged hay field. The proposed use for the property will be land managed for protection of natural resources, including rare species, habitat and a vernal pool and include public access for passive outdoor recreation purposes. The property is adjacent to the Norwatic Rail Trail. Enclosed is a locus map marked Exhibit A, which shows the property <coughs> in which we are interested in. So that's what we're talking about. Mr. Hayden. So the answer to my question is zero, and that's okay sure. too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any <coughs> other questions then about this? So we've made the announcement, duly noted, and now the question of, um, of shortening the waiver period. I think we've addressed concerns about that, and everyone's good. So Ms. Stein. Okay, I move the following. Pursuant to the Massachusetts General Laws and 301 CMR 51.00 at SEC, the Amherst Select Board hereby agrees to waive the 120 uh, day notice period and do hereby approve the acquisition by the Department of Conserva Conservation and Recreation of approximately 5.0 four four plus or minus acres of land or other property interest in the town of Amherst in less than one hundred and twenty days. Second. Further discussion. Mr. Hayden. Um, I'm just, just reading the motion the the, the, the form it's oh no I, I got it. I figured it out. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that was unanimous. Okay, let's do a couple of quick things. Um, we have a taxi license. I move that the select board approve a new 2013 taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Dennis Racine of East Hampton, MA, on behalf of Aaron's Transportation. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Uh, common day. I move that the select board amend the common vic victor license for Bess M. M. Fom doing business as College Pizza at 150 Fearing Street for hours Sunday through Thursday from 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. closing and Friday and Saturday from 1 a.m. <coughs> to 2 a.m. closing. Bess M. M. Fom owner manager. Somehow that seems wrong. <laughs> doesn't match the yeah <laughs> <coughs> we have a new motion sheet but oh what he asked it doesn't right it doesn't um, his application is differs it's just from one to two doesn't seem For Sunday, right Thursday it says 11 a.m. to new 1 a.m which makes sense rather than being open for an hour. Right, that's <laughs> what I mean. And Friday Question. and Saturday from I missed 11 a.m. to 2 a.m. Oh. That's what it looks, that's what it says on, mm -hmm. the, on the request. I w on this the is request. already a revision of a prior I, one and exactly. I don't think it's right yet. I don't think he Thank plans you. to just be open <laughs> for three <an> hours <laughs> or an hour. <laughs> Well, seem unlikely. Um, I think this really shouldn't be voted. It should go back to him to figure out the timing. Well, why is our motion so different? <coughs> well, are we just missing? Is this just a noon problem on Thursday? It should be noon. N no, at one a.m. No, the, the, it says the eleven on his app. The actual yeah. request. I mean, <laughs> what he's put in here is. Um, let's see. <laughs> let's call him Mr. Misanti and see if yep. he can help us. Yep. I want to suggest that the select board uh, amend the motion sheet so that it is uh, consistent with the application itself. So yeah, that the application doesn't make sense. That's the problem. Even those hours are strange. So he has from 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. That does make sense. That one, I guess, works. And then the Friday, Saturday would be 11 a.m. to 2 a.m. Okay, <coughs> okay, that will work. So the motion sheet changes are changing the 12 a.m. to 11 a.m. Okay, And the 1 a.m. to 11 a.m. 
Second. Okay. I've got a bunch of extra and missing ones here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. As We're amended, further discussion. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. okay. Now it is 645, and our 645 item is something rather delightful and different. We are going to be honoring a certain um, quite distinguished member of our community, as well as taking care of a little bit of business in relation to him. So uh, the individual is none other than Mr. Stan Zomek. And uh, Mr. Musanti, would you like to tell us about this? Uh, sure, and uh, uh, Stan is here and uh, will be formally uh, making some uh, gifts to the community uh, on a couple of projects that he has had a direct hand in making a reality. Uh, the purchase and installation and for low these many years the maintenance of the lights over at community field on the baseball field um, and uh, the uh, beautiful work in Sweetser Park in and around the fountain uh, major fundraising and so there'll be some donation letters but first uh, um, drafted uh, with the help of uh, uh, staff and others including staff who know the gentleman uh, uh, very well since birth uh, on a resolution uh, that recites Stan's long history with the community over 40 years uh, as a town employee uh, in leadership positions including uh, acting town manager multiple times uh, head of the DPW uh, and any number of building projects uh, and then uh, uh, serving the community in many, many other ways, including over 60 years of uh, service with uh, uh, founding and, and running Amherst Baseball all these years, gen uh, serving many, many generations. So uh, there's a proclamation that's been prepared uh, for the select board's consideration tonight that someone might want to read. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, as a... Okay. As a town leader, as a parent, as a as a former coach and friend, uh, you know, stands uh, one of the treasures of the town, and it's it's great to honor him in this way. Well, I'm pleased to do so, given that he gave my son his football jersey, <laughs> which was greatly <laughs> treasured. <laughs> Whereas Stanley P. Zomack has served the town of Amherst as a dedicated town employee for over 41 years, including service as supervisor of maintenance, supervisor of recreation, superintendent of highways and parks, superintendent of public works, tree warden, assistant to the town manager, and acting town manager on numerous occasions, and whereas Amherst citizen Stanley P. Zomack has served the town of Amherst in many capacities for over 60 years, including service on the Mill River Recreation Building Committee, Crocker Farm Building Committee, Wildwood School Building Committee, Middle School Advisory Board, Regional Refuse Disposals Planning Board, Eastern Hampshire Solid Waste District, 250th Anniversary Committee, Kendrick Park Committee, Community Preservation Act Committee, Comprehensive Planning Committee, Recreation Commission, and Leisure Services Supplemental Education Commission. And whereas Amherst citizen Stanley P. Zomek has served the town of Amherst tirelessly in his commitment to public land in the town of Amherst, including negotiation and acquisition of Blumbrook Recreation Area, Mill River Recreation Area, land on Chestnut and Strong Street for the middle school, and Wildwood Elementary, the town's la landfill, Market Hill Road water treatment plant, as well as supported acquisition of the Hawthorne property on East Pleasant and the Ruxton parcel on Pulpit Hill Road. And whereas Stanley P. Zomek has served the town of Amherst working on construction projects including the wastewater treatment plant, landfill and capping of the old landfill, rough park, ball fields and picnic area, the Mill River Recreation Area, 1950s reconstruction of community field, 
reconstruction of the fountain and walkway in Sweetser Park with the Rotary Club, recreation fields on Stanley Street with the Kiwanis Club, administration of a fund drive for the pool with the War Memorial Pool Trustees, supervision of construction of War Memorial Pool and Fields with the Recreation Commission, and whereas Stanley P. Zomek has further served the town of Amherst community, including services as the president of the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce in 1979, founding of the Amherst Little League and, and Babe Ruth programs, coordination of programming as Amherst League president, opening the Amherst League to girls, the first in Western Massachusetts to do so, serving as Western MA District 2 Commissioner and as President of the National Babe Ruth League and as Chair of the Babe Ruth World Series Committee, managing tournaments all over the nation, serving as coach, umpire, supervisor of umpires, and most importantly, mentoring generations of Amherst children. And whereas Amherst citizen Stanley P. Zomek has provided many services to the town of Amherst well beyond the call of duty, especially during periods of severe financial constraints. Now, therefore, we, the select board of the town of Amherst, commend Stanley P. Zomek for his outstanding service and hereby proclaim Saturday, April 27th, 2013, as Stanley P. Zomek Day in the town of Amherst. Second. Mr. Hayden. So there's no truth that he also signed the Declaration of Independence? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not old enough. He's a mere young man. <laughs> So it is our great honor to make this uh, resolution, and this will be read and celebrated at an event on April 27th. There will be a, uh, a, an, a dinner in Mr. Zomek's honor and a fundraiser for Amherst Baseball. Uh, tickets for that are available at the Chamber and in other places. Am I missing any details on that event? No, and tickets are still available for Saturday, April 27th. Should be a great, great night to be an Amherst... Uh, Citizen, come out and enjoy and honor, honor Stan Zomek. So thank you, Mr. Zomek, for all that you have done for the town low these many years. Uh, we can officially vote to sign the proclamation. All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I think a round of applause is in order. Sure. <laughs> Okay, and then we've got the uh, gift acceptances. So how does that work exactly? Uh, sure. Uh, in, your, in your packet, uh, you should have two, two letters of donation. Uh, and the first one is related to community field. Um, and yeah, to the packet. So I mentioned in my opening remarks the community fundraising effort, you know, spearheaded by, by Stan uh, many years ago now to uh, install uh, lights at the ball field, uh, the baseball field over at Community Field, and uh, it was a big fundraising effort. Uh, and uh, lights were put in, and there was a there's a small balance in the uh, fundraising account. Uh, the Amherst Ath Athletic uh, Alumni Association has been uh, keeper of those funds and been using them uh, piecemeal uh, for maintenance needs. And uh, um, donation has been uh, offered to the community, which is the purpose of of, of, of the business tonight. And and ask Stan to. Well, uh, the, the lights have been up for roughly 10 years or so, <laughs> and there's no maintenance done. And it, there's a question who would maintain the lights if a bank went out? 
And in our discussion, David Knightley, who might be if Hopkins could beat baseball, he may show up. But anyway, uh, we decided that to initiate a maintenance account with the town that would perpetuate itself without a financial problem for anyone. So I have a check here for $7,500 as agreed upon to initiate that uh, maintenance account. David, would you take it up to Mr. Massani? He handles all the money. Thank you very much. So do we, I, do I, we I have I would a want, uh, like to mention one thing with uh, John Redall and uh, whoever on this big issue, that my first pay for the town in 1950 was 90 cents per hour. <laughs> We get 82 cents an hour, on, or no, per day, I'm sorry, 82 oh, cents a day for select board, so I feel your pain. <laughs> okay, so do we have a formal motion on the community fields uh, acceptance? It's not on the motion sheet. Oh, it's not on the motion sheet. Revision, so we can wing no. it. Mr. Zomer. If I could just add one point of clarification that it that it is the donation of the lights and the fund, right. Right. So, which is significant. And, and um, you know, uh, 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 I know the fundraising, all the people and all the time that went into fundraising for those lights, it, it was a significant cost and a, and a great benefit to Amherst Athletics. Absolutely, and, and it's a... And well, the lights actually cost about $95,000. Amount. Okay, so I think Mr. Mishanti is drafting a motion for us as we <laughs> speak to make sure that we properly accept both the property and the money to the gift account. Yeah. Um, my suggested motion, and I apologize for the lack of the wording on the motion sheet, a uh, motion to accept the donation of lights at Community Field uh, and uh, a contribution of $7,500 from the Amherst Athletic Alumni Association uh, per their letter of April 22nd, 2013, I which so would move. be put into the file. I so the move. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. thank you. Aye, that's unanimous. And then the Sweetser Park Fountain. Sweetser Park Fountain. Uh, again, Mr. Zomack can fill in uh, another fundraising effort uh, this from a group aptly named the Friends of Sweetser Park uh, on the fountain area. And there's a significant balance uh, remaining that he wishes to donate to the town to be used uh, for future repair and maintenance of the fountain marble, granite, and engraved bricks in the park. And there's a letter to that effect also dated today. Um, and the friends were Andy Jones, Justin Barnes, who's in Atlanta, Georgia. But Andy Jones couldn't be here because he's managing a baseball team. <laughs> and myself were the friends. And selling the bricks and getting other do donation uh, after we were all done, we did have a balance of $20,181. And that's to be used to repair the fountain in the future and the bricks. As you know, the fountain was out of commission from 1975, and the town had no money to repair it until the Rotary Club stepped in about 1993-94. And at the rededication, I would, we passed those on too, and they didn't have enough for everybody. It was done in 1975, and it's still running. And it is a real treasure of the downtown and just makes that park. So thank you again very, very much. And we have another <laughs> motion. Uh, moving to accept the donation of $20,181.57 from the Friends of Sweetser Park uh, for the purposes outlined in their letter dated April 22nd, 2013. I so move. Second. Further discussion? 
All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Sorry, we don't have any more. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them coming. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Stanzomac Day on Saturday. Yes. There you go. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I stopped in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> Let's see, it's now time for our seven o'clock item, which is the FY13 third quarter budget update. Stan, don't let us keep your flyers. We'll get them today. We'll get them back here. And we have Mr. Pooler here to talk to us about the third quarter budget update, and we have a memo in our packets. So thank you very much for being here, Mr. Pooler. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, and I would like at the uh, onset to, uh, outset to, Thank Sonia Aldrich, our comptroller, who's uh, very good work for the town all the time, keeps track of all these numbers, and who is deserving uh, or enjoying a well-deserved vacation with her family on the West Coast. Um, so I get to fill in just by myself tonight. Um, we said that the budget um, this year was a uh, no-drama budget, and I think for 14 we said it was a slow and steady budget and our third quarter report could be a ho-hum report because there's we're right on track <laughs> there are no big surprises um, I'm happy to report we are three quarters of the way through the year um, this report shows that we've collected 79 percent of our budgeted revenues um, that's a little bit higher than you would expect only because there are of certain timing things uh, certain transfers happen right away, so um, they're not reflected through the course of the year uh, on a steady pace, uh, such as the departmental um, revenues from the Recreation Department where there's an administrative transfer from the revolving fund that comes all at <coughs> once. Uh, so that looks a little higher than it probably really is. In the income area, I think the only area that I think is of real concern is investment income that continues to lag because we are in a very low interest rate environment and from year to year it kind of sort of gets worse because in prior years we had some CDs that were a little bit longer term that matured and now reinvesting those in new CDs you just don't get the same rate so um, we're going to continue to look at that and um, I will um, I think as we go forward, we may have to adjust that down further in, in for FY14 once we set the recap sheet. Um, but that ha that has lagged. <coughs> Everything else is doing pretty well. Um, motor vehicle excise taxes, which are a big source for us, are uh, uh, on target uh, with where we expect them to be this year uh, with continued growth in car sales and so those are uh, keeping a pace um, our other departmental revenue we did have um, some nice surprises there uh, we had a one-time refund from the Commonwealth for the money that we normally have to pay them for our teachers being in the uh, GIC for the retired teachers insurance um, they actually gave us a refund this year and that that's not going to happen again because now we're out of the GIC but I think it was about $86,000 that was a, a nice one-time source of funds. Um, the hotel motel tax and the meals tax are doing very well. Hotel tax is at 104% of its budget so far. Um, the meals tax is right on pace at 74%. Um, so uh, those continue to meet expectations and, and in case the hotel tax actually exceed them. Um, and the most important thing uh, on the next page, it refers to our property tax where we've uh, collected just over 75, 75.9%. Um, since that's our biggest source of income, it's very good to see that that is on pace. And state aid has come in and at the rate that we expect it to. Um, <coughs> on the expenditure side in the general fund, uh, the one department that sort of stands out in the sheets that we handed out is information technology because they had to expend so much money to replace the audiovisual equipment here. That will be made up mostly from um, an insurance settlement and there's something that <coughs> is on the warrant for the town meeting to deal with that. 
Um, everything else is really uh, continuing apace. Um, again, with the exception of our insurance costs, which are up slightly, insurance rates have increased. We have made an adjustment in the FY14 budget to supplement those accounts so that they will have sufficient funds next year. Um, overall, that deficit in that area in general services will be made up from savings in other parts of general government, so we don't see a problem there. Um, and other spending um, we are tracking, um, but I think it is fine. And the um, question that always comes up is about snow and ice. Uh, on the sheets here, you'll see that looks like there's a deficit, but in fact, there are a number of encumbrances <coughs> for things like buying more sand and so on. And since we really don't have to do that, we will liquidate those encumbrances, and so we should be in fine <coughs> shape there. Um, veteran services will have a deficit. A again, you see it projected here on these sheets. Um, we know that, so there is an article at town meeting to do a transfer of $35,000 to make up some of that. We did also put more money in the FY14 budget to continue to try to fund that uh, adequately. Um, but again, I think overall we won't have any deficits that will create a free cash problem <coughs> or anything um, because there are other departments that will have savings. Finally, the um, enterprise funds are on track for their spending and their revenue. Um, water and sewer and solid waste are all doing fine. I continue to closely monitor the revenue on the um, transportation fund, uh, because frankly, we're not writing as many tickets um, as we have in the past. Um, in some ways, that's a good thing, because tickets are supposed to deter behavior that you don't want to have happen. So some people would say in an ideal world, you wouldn't write any tickets. I would never say that, but <laughs> <laughs> some people might. Um, it is something that we continu I continue to keep a, a, an eye on, so those revenue numbers are down just a little bit. Everything else is going at the pace we expect it to. Um, so it's a little bit of a ho-hum report, but um, for these kind of reports, that's probably good. Definitely. Ho-hum we will take. Everything tracking just as expected without concerns or uh, or drama discrepancy is uh, exactly what we want to see and uh, again we thank you for this very detailed report it, it's it's so good to get this check in every three months and really just to know where things are um, questions or comments from the select board this time is it the speed bumps that are coming down <laughs> on the <laughs> maybe we should take them out <laughs> no those would be those are um, fines for uh, moving violations these are these, these are, are these are tickets. The fines are actually coming in fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that's uh, bad. but it's the parking <laughs> tickets that uh, we're just not writing as many. Other questions or comments, Ms. Brewer. It's probably all those one dollar transactions on credit cards. They're <laughs> protecting. <laughs> The other thing I would just wanted to mention is I really appreciate you telling us as we were going along, you know, that we've already adjusted upward for the other types of insurance, the not health insurance, and also for veteran services. You know, that that's the other thing that gives us that reassurance over the course of the year. Yeah, things are a little bit like this, and then we've already adjusted for the upcoming year, so that's really great. And then just to emphasize again, so we actually got money from the state we didn't expect. That's really a bonus on a move when we move the teachers over. And you said that was in the 80,000? Wow, excellent. Yeah, no, it was, uh, they keep very careful track of the charges from mm -hmm. year to year. And, and at the end of the day, when we pulled out of the GIC, they said, oh, well, actually, we owe you some money. Yeah. We're complaining mm -hmm. enough about around. the state. I want to say, yay, state, for that. Thanks. Other questions or comments <coughs> on the budget update? Questions or comments from the public on the budget update? All right. Then thank you very much. Thank really appreciate all. this, and uh, Thanks, we'll talk again in three months. <laughs> okay, let's see. 709, so that is the same as 710, which is the beginning of this week's um, town meeting warrant article review. Uh, we have, tonight we're doing, we're finishing up uh, most of the budget stuff, and we are doing zoning. Um, 
but first we're starting with the Amherst Pelham Region Regional Assessment Model. We did invite the folks from the schools to come if they wanted to. Do you know if they opted to or not? Uh, they are, are not coming. They're not coming, okay. So we decided that really the, their budget right. doesn't change dramatically from year to year. The select board is familiar with how both the, bud uh, the uh, library and um, school budgets work, and all of those have been debated in great detail at the right. school committee and library meetings. So we opted to give them the opportunity to do a commercial yeah. on this if they wanted to, but to not have to come in and explain right. to us stuff we already know. Ms. Brewer. And also a quick plug for budget coordinating group because budget coordinating group keep you know we all talk every so often about where are we at with our budgets I is there any expected drama etc so we can feel assured from that right as well right and and you know I we can't um, what's the word is it underestimate overestimate can't speak highly enough about the, the value for that coordination because uh you know I like to sense like word dramas in other towns periodically and you know when the when the school folks and the town folks become completely um out of uh, out of sync uh, really bad things happen and it's incredible how um, how the distance in their budget planning can grow and f at the end of the day folks have no idea what the what the other folks are doing so that is not at all the, the situation in Amherst we're very fortunate to have really excellent budget coordination um, so the schools and the libraries were able to completely meet the finance committee guidelines and, and they've addressed all of their issues internally so we will start with Article 15, which is the Amherst Pelham Regional Assessment Model. This is one of these uh, articles that we have to do every year to <coughs> deal with the fact that we are using an alternative to the state's formula for regional assessment. This is this takes a rolling five-year average, uh, or rather, a five-year average of the. Uh, student population from each of the communities in the region to determine the assessment and town meetings in each of those towns need to vote on this every year. Mr. Saint. That's exactly right and it requires a vote each and every year. So town meeting has seen this article for the past several years when we reverted essentially back to the re original regi regional agreement about how the assessment assessments are, are distributed amongst the member communities. So this article is before all four towns once again, just prior to consideration of the school budget itself. And we're recommending approval, as is the uh, Regional School Committee. Um, I th think it's not unreasonable to imagine that this might have more questions this year, considering the, um, the, the situation with the regional school uh, planning uh, process that's ongoing. So this could be folks' opportunity to kind of ask for, I'm not sure if there's going to be an, um, an update from folks under article one do you know a brief one <laughs> a brief one yeah so <laughs> since there are it's a little it's a little soon even with town meeting right. being relatively late <coughs> it's a little decisions won't have been made yet at, by town meeting so but oh. it is confusing. but I, I appreciate that that comment because it, if nothing <coughs> else it's important that people be aware that if regionalization pre-k to six happens based on the votes in the various towns in the fall then when it comes time for annual town meeting there will be a second one of these assessment method discussions and it's theoretically possible this one will change but there will be two of these kinds of motions because we will have we would have two districts then so yeah there might be an update at that point mr hayden and in the meantime i'm recalling that at the four towns meeting that this model was generally acceptable I, I, there was some there was some discussion but it was generally okay so all right the schools do always figure it out based on on both models just so all right. the communities can look at uh, the plus and minuses of both but uh it consistently is agreed that this is the fairest way to do this for for all the communities all right miss stein would you like to make the motion sure i move that the select board recommend to the may 6 2013 <laughs> annual town meeting Article 15, Amherst Pelham Regional School District Assessment Model. Method. Right. Second. Further discussion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Uh, next up is the, oh, Ms. Brewer, would you like to speak to that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> she Give can. my little commercial. She That's can. Right. <laughs> All right, uh, next is the, uh, back to Article 16, which we mostly dealt with last time, um, the operating budget schools portion. So we did kind of the little intro to that. We do have the school budgets in our packets. Those are online for everyone who is following, following along at home. Um, but we're not going to go into great detail on them. Mr. Musampi, is there anything 
you would like to say in general about the elementary and or regional budgets? Uh, I think reinforcing the main point you made that both budget proposals have been uh, recommended by the respective school committees and they are uh, completely responsive to the uh, budget guidelines that were put out uh, in November by the Amherst Finance Committee that um, uh, allow for a 3% increase uh, uh, in the uh, Amherst assessment for the regional schools and um, just over a 2% increase on the uh, uh, elementary schools, which is the, a, the equivalent of a 3% increase to the base, but subtracting back out some one-time monies that were used to support the current year budget from uh, free cash in anticipation of school choice revenues, uh, replacing that in, in, in next year. So uh, both of those proposals were made by the superintendent and vetted through a very public uh, hearing process through the school committees and they've been recommended for approval and are, uh, we're, we're good. Thank you and thank you for making the point about the, um, the school choice. So basically that makes whole what had been kind of them borrowing against the future uh, last year. So there's the understanding we all had reached exactly last year right. when budgets were recommended to town meeting. And that was that was why we did that that we recommended that free cash uh, appropriation which town meeting supported so all right further conversation discussion about the school <coughs> elementary or regional assessment hmm. anyone public want to comment on that all right Ms. Stein would you like to make the motions I move that the select board recommend to the May 6 2013 annual town meeting article 16 FY14 operating budget elementary schools in the amount of $21,989,199. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous in the region. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting article 16 <coughs> FY 2014 operating budget regional schools in the amount of $29,130,815 and the appropriation of $14,158,830 for Amherst proportional share. Second. Further discussion? Anything more to be said on the region, Mr. Jacobs? No? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 So who's Anonymous. speaking to the schools? Alyssa? Sure. <laughs> well, my theory was that if Mr. Hayden wanted to do it, all of the operating, oh, those oh, that would be fine, That's fine. fine. <laughs> yeah. right, so okay. 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 All right. I won't ask that question yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Shall all right. I do the so library? then the next up, sure, you can make the motion, then we'll talk about it. Oh, okay. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting article 16 FY 2014 operating budget libraries in the amount of two million three hundred thirty nine thousand seven hundred and fifty seven with town tax support of one million seven hundred and forty one thousand five hundred and twelve dollars second further discussion so uh, this was another uh, excellent planning process excellent coordination pro uh, process with the uh, with the town and the schools um, again this budget meets the finance committee guidelines um, it was done extra early this time I think that this budget came out uh, like the day before the town manager's budget <laughs> which was fun duly noted <laughs> <laughs> Library director. Uh, anything else you would like to add no, it, again responsive to uh, uh, the, the available uh, constrained revenues uh, and uh, Director Sherry and the library trustees did an excellent job articulating uh, in their budget proposal, which is posted online, including in tonight's packet, along with the uh, school budgets, um, a good job explaining the operations of the library, uh, upcoming uh, goals and objectives, and uh, some performance information, and uh, explaining what's going on with their other funding sources. Uh, uh, a multi-year plan to uh, position the endowment uh, 
for, for sustainability long term. Uh, and so there's a number of initiatives, a very uh, reinvigorated uh, fundraising effort, et cetera. So uh, a very thorough picture. I encourage folks to uh, read up on the library budget in that report. Thank you. Further discussion? Any comment from the public on the library budget? Yeah, and all in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, now we get into zoning articles, and we have uh, Mr. Tucker here from the Planning Department and Mr. Crowner here from Zoning Subcommittee. And we have uh, in, in our town meeting packets, and I hope folks brought the information on the following articles. And just so f um, you folks know, we did have public comment at the beginning from uh, Ms. Perot, who was expressing concern about, um, I believe it was 31 through 33, or 32, uh, the first couple, about it's um, about the timeliness of the articles given the lack of the housing study and uh, not being able to get full information about what the implications might be. So uh, she had to leave, but just so you know, that was public comment <coughs> at the beginning. So uh, we do have these in our packets, but uh, why don't you tell us what you'd like us to know extra about Article 30. And welcome. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm uh, representing the Planning Board. I'm Rob Crowder. Um, Article 30 is is, uh, is a just corrects uh, a duplication of, of effort that we did in the in the fall town meeting, in which we passed uh, two uh, competing sets of, of standards and conditions for converted dwellings. Um, we passed one that that called for oversight that included um, um, professional management of converted dwellings. And subsequently, we passed, that is, town meeting passed um, a condition that required owner occupancy or resident manager for converted dwellings. So the, the clear intent of town meeting was, was the latter, and, and so this just uh, erases the, the duplication of the previous one. Great. Questions or comments about this? We kind of knew this was coming based on yep. the discussion from the, from the previous um, town meeting. Okay, anyone from the public like to comment on Article 30? You're good? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, select board, uh, Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? Yes. If I can find it, just give me a minute. There it goes. Okay. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 30, <coughs> zoning converted dwellings. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, and we'll go back to speakers for all of these at the end. Okay, so then Article Thirty One. I'm going to introduce uh, Article Thirty One along with uh, Thirty Two and Thirty Five. Those are the three that we're presenting as uh, sort of a package, um, as <coughs> our as our main um, uh, work this this year. These these articles are, uh, first of all, you have the the map of the town, nice colorful map. These articles are focused on the on the red spots, that's that's all. We're affecting. Um, that's those are our business zones. Th it's not affecting any of the yellow or the <coughs> gray or the green. It's just the red. And these these articles are are motivated um, by our our continuing effort to implement the master plan and its vision of enhan of enhancing our village centers. And also by the housing production plan, which indicates a significant shortfall in our housing supply across a range of demographics. So how can we address these? What we're trying to do is make it possible for more housing to, to happen in Amherst, but to direct it to the centers, while at the same time uh, trying to make it so that people want to live there and so that businesses want to locate there. Our strategy is, is to make some changes to our business zones in a, in a more uh, broad application than, than before, but also uh, more incremental, not as dramatic, at least in our opinion. We're doing that by loosening some restrictions that speak to capacity and tightening some that speak to form or character. So that's, that's the, uh, the introduction to these, these three. So the first one, Article 31, uh, is standards and conditions for mixed-use buildings. 
currently mixed-use buildings, um, these are the only kinds of uh, residential use that are allowed in, in certain zones, the BL and the comm zones. Those zones don't allow apartments and so on. Um, so, so if there's going to be any residential in those areas, it has to be in a mixed-use building. A mixed-use building contains generally commercial and, and or retail or something on the ground floor and residential on upper floors. But those residential uses are constrained by lot size. Uh, they're constrained by uh, a fairly low threshold for a special permit. What we're proposing to do is raise the threshold at which a, a special permit is required to put residential use in mixed use buildings. And also um, allow for the possibility of some residential use on the ground floor of mixed use buildings, which currently is not allowed other than staircases and things that serve upper floors. So um, our proposal is, is to put the threshold for a special permit in mixed use buildings, residential uses at 10 units, raising it from six. It's actually six or 6,000 square feet or um, more than twice as much as, as the ground floor uh, use. Um, all of these things are make it difficult to to attain any kind of residential use on, on upper floors. And we want there to be mixed-use buildings. We want mixed-use buildings to be built. We want them to thrive. And so uh, we think that we need to allow for uh, more possibility for residential use. That's what this is intended to do. Uh, the, the, with regard to the ground floor residential use, uh, currently, it's restricted to 10%, and that's incidental to upper floor use. Uh, we're proposing to increase it to 40%, um, of which only 15% can be incidental to upper, upper floors. That means that uh, around 25% is possible for uh, ground floor residential units for living space. Um, and we're going to direct that to the rear of buildings. We want to maintain a commercial streetscape. So um, I, I think in, in most cases, there will not be a, a, a dramatic amount of ground floor residential use. It, it will require actually a large building in order to have a lot of, of units, but there might be room for one unit, two units in, in, in a standard uh, mixed use building. Um, that, that's the summary. Okay, questions or comments from select board about article 31, Mr. Eden. I wasn't able to go to the public hearing on this. I'm wondering what issues w were raised there that we might want to consider. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there, there are two main considerations. One is that, as I said, uh, um, mixed-use buildings are the only possibility for residential use in commercial zones and, and BL zones. Um, there are, uh, are some people who are concerned about allowing more, com more residential use in commercial zones. So that's a concern. Anytime you, anytime you make it more possible, then, then there's more possibility of people actually living there. So that's a concern. Which is the point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is or it isn't, who knows? <laughs> um, the other possible concern is that um, allowing ground floor residential use uh, sort of dilutes the purpose of, of a mixed use building. Um, so, because the rear entrance helps that exactly right. That's yeah. That's the point. Yes. Ms. Stein, you had your hand raised. I don't know how reasonable this question is, but I'm wondering about building mixed-use buildings if we don't have businesses willing to take up the space. I watched how slowly um, the space <laughs> behind Zuby's it was vacant for a long, long time. So I guess the zoning is reasonable. I certainly approve of, of the suggestions that you're making. I'm just wondering if, you know, buildings get built and then the front stays vacant because there aren't businesses willing to be built. Um, yeah, that's a concern. It is a concern, I agree. Um, and I guess I would say that um, the, there's clearly a market for housing, and so one 
response to your Excuse thing me. is is yeah. just allow housing there, but but that but that means that there's less space for commercial, and so we actually want to promote both, and so um, so presumably um, they will happen in tandem, perhaps slowly, but um, we want to make the possibility there. Mr. Wall. Yeah, just briefly. Thank you. That was very clear and helpful. I, my impression from reading the description of the other articles to the explanation was that precisely for the reasons Ms. Stein referred to, that purely commercial buildings are not going to be as su successful either. So the idea is by the mixed use to attract greater vitality and bring people who live there plus the businesses. A, a good split approach to the problem. Other questions and comments from Select Board? Mr. Hayden. In the um, housing production report, there was um, some, some discussion on the value uh, the need for um, live work type of, of residential units. Um, does this um, uh, add those types of units to our stock? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't mention it explicitly, but I'm, I'm wondering if there's a sense that it might. That, that is part of the intent. Um, so so that's, that was the motivation. That was why we started thinking about ground floor residential use in, in, in uh, mixed-use buildings as a sort of a live uh, a response to to a live work need um, so yeah anytime you you allow someone to live where there is business there's a greater possibility that the person who lives there will actually work in the business or vice versa the person who has the business will find a place to live there other questions um, mr. Hayden, sorry. yeah and that's an interesting distinction to make people who are, are living where they work as a, 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 a similar to people who are living where they own a business where they work no mm -hmm. it's, it's most people don't know that actually that's what this big curtain is here that we <laughs> all keep we all <laughs> kind of live there and <laughs> our beds are back there. our shots are it's cozy <laughs> Ms. Burr. i just wanted to take this opportunity before i forget to say thank you thank you thank you to the planning board and the planning department staff for getting reports to us in the first town meeting mailing. I know that's a big struggle to get done, to try and get the hearing completed, the work done to actually write the report, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I always gripe about it every year that we get them all at the last minute. And it's gotten better over the years. And this is really exceptional to have had several in the first mailing. So thank you, please. Thanks for your feedback. Do what you can to keep it going, it's great. Other questions or comments from Select Board? All right, anyone from the public like to comment on Article 31? Ms. Keller. <coughs> Thank you, Janet Keller, Precinct 1. Um, if I may just briefly preface my remarks about Article 31 with uh, some remarks about the package of the main zoning package. Um, and talk about the challenges that it's presented to us as citizens trying and members of town meeting trying to understand as best we could, you know, no one can predict the future and this is expected to play out over time. I perfectly well understand <coughs> that, but even when I take a 10 acre parcel and try to um, go back and forth among all the references, I'm having a devil of a time trying to work out what the impacts are. At one point I came up with, well, it could be about 200, 250 units now, and it could be 300 later, but I can't really be sure. And then, of course, those numbers translate. Um, if you multiply them by four um, into quite a few units, 1,200. So the I, one thing I want to say is it's a big package. It's got some big pieces. The pieces are intertwined, and they're very complex. And that alone has raised concerns and makes people a little edgy. Um, that said, the other thing I think um, that the folks that um, are in North Amherst uh, are very concerned about is that we um, are impacted by a relatively large area um, that is next to some unprotected farmland, historic resources, 
um, and uh, <coughs> conservation areas. And the whole principle of the master plan is to develop first and to focus on those areas that most need redevelopment and infill that are already developed. Um, so um, I, I want to say we share the concerns about uh, mixed use, uh, in intensifying the residential use and mixed use, pushing out businesses. That certainly is the line of res least resistance. Um, and we are eager to have businesses that would serve our, com our neighborhood and the surrounding areas. Um, so um, that's a concern for us. And um, I think that's basically it. We're concerned it's a big area. It would, be, it would greatly increase the density. It's very uh, complex and intertwined. Some days I say intertwangled when I'm trying to do the math. And um, we're very concerned about it, it pushing out uh, businesses that we badly want in our village center. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Other folks from the public? Um, Ms. Adams. Morianne Adams, uh, is this working? Precinct 10. Uh, we had raised these points with the uh, planning board. Uh, a very great concern for many of us was that the intertwined package was simply too big. We felt that the North Amherst uh, area, which had been wisely separated from Atkins Corner in an earlier discussion at town meeting, was not really a village center. It's a very broad package of acreage. And in that, it differs from the other much smaller areas, and I think arguably fair and appropriate areas. So it seems to me that the package is a setup for an up or down vote for people who might want to vote for it, but cannot vote for the North Amherst piece. Uh, we discussed this with the planning board. The planning board said that they were all calm areas and couldn't be separated. But I still feel that with a careful scalpel, it should be possible to make the kind of distinction that would enable us to vote for the remainder of the package while separating the North Amherst issues, which are different both in quality and in kind from the issues raised by the other parts of the uh, article. So I regret that they are linked, and I appeal to the select board, as I had appealed to the planning board, to please find a way to disentangle them. Most serious in my mind for the North Amherst part is that, as uh, uh, Janet Keller said a moment ago, there's no real calculus for the impact. And with such a broad area and so many potential scenarios of development there, I think it's seriously risky for the inhabitants of North Amherst. And finally, I would like to remind us that the master plan had two components, two major themes. One, of course, is development, but the other is protection and sustaining neighborhoods. And I often find that we emphasize the one at the expense of the other. So my basic request is that we find a mode of disentanglement. Thank you. Thank you. Other folks want to comment on this article? Okay. Uh, further questions or comments by select board? Mr. Crowner, would you like to address any of the issues raised? Um, it's, it's true that, w that, that we can't know what the impact is going to be, but, but we also don't really know, and we're not counting the impact um, that not doing anything is having. I mean, what the status quo is. Um, we, I, I think the, the points that are raised are, are very important, and, and they and um, they they make a lot of sense to me. Um, but the feeling of the planning board is that um, all of our all of our business zones, including the con zone, are um, potential mixed use um, residential commercial areas. Um, they and and we should think of them all as as centers. They have uh, 
different sets of, of dimensional regulations. They have different sets, sets of uh, use possibilities. Um, so they're going to be they're going to differ, but there's um, the the original point of the com zone um, to try and attract uh, heavy industry or a mall or something like that. That's not going to happen. It's 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 not going to happen. Um, it's it's probably not really what we want. Um, so so we need to find a way to to uh, use them differently, to think of them differently. Um, the other point that I would like to make is that um, as far as uh, saving neighborhoods goes, that's also extremely important to the planning board. And people will differ. But, uh, but our uh, approach is that we are attempting to save neighborhoods by directing <coughs> new housing, new um, residential use to centers rather than neighborhoods. I mean, that's th our neighborhoods are under, th under threat. And... Um, and we need to either kick them all out, which we can't do, or find somewhere else for them to go. And so that's, that's, that's part of what this is about. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments from Selectman or Mr. Tucker? I'd like to speak briefly, if I could, to the uh, question of impact. I'd like to, um, and I'll go over all three of the um, amendments, uh, Article 31, 32, and 35, very briefly. Basically, the changes are not large. Remember, what's happening is that the mixed-use building is going from six upper floor units to ten by right. Anything more than that, anything bigger than that, automatically goes to special permit, which is the way it works now. So that's not a huge change. It makes them slightly more viable. Um, uh, Article 32 makes changes to several... Um, of the minor uh, uh, dimensional uh, regulations, front setback being one of the most important, it's creating a range for in order to bring new buildings up to the street to create a pedestrian streetscape. Um, probably the most significant change under Article 32 is the addition of a uh, footnote B uh, so that minimum lot area and additional lot area family is no longer tied to uh, residential units uh, in that in that district that is the way it is now in the general business district in the downtown it's the way it is in all of our village center districts and this is an attempt to <coughs> shift the limited business districts and the commercial districts maps of which you have to becoming as mr. Crowner says more like centers and less like potential shopping mall areas um, that does uh, create both uh, the opportunity for more units, remembering that if you have a mixed-use building, you still have that limitation of 10, be above which is a, a special permit. Uh, because um, we had an example during one of the earlier uh, hearings on this where someone was proposing to uh, develop the concept for a building in, in North Amherst, and the lot that they were on would allow them to have you know, a three-story building, which is the size of the the building that's permitted in that district, four apartments, no more than four. So they ended up with two huge apartments conceptually on the upper, the two upper floors. The only which, the only way to make viable would be to make them into many, 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 many bedrooms, which lends itself to you can imagine. Um, with the removal of that limitation, you can have more smaller units fewer bedrooms on upper floors uh, with the opportunity of having a market other than students, which is part of the uh, intent here. Uh, finally, Article 35, and I'll just, um, I don't mean to preempt things here, but just to talk about how it knits together, takes some of the uh, dimensions that are created under Article 32 and tries to cause buildings that are now uh, the result of 1960s and 1970s zoning for, for highway a commercial strip development uh, and are set well back from the road with driveways and parking in front of them pull any additions or expansions would come up to the street to create that pedestrian uh, streetscape o over time uh, that's not a, um, a spur to greater intensity that's directing where intensity goes so the overall 
uh, impacts of these in all of the districts in which they're located, although it's impossible to quantify, uh, is not uh, huge and doesn't begin to approach the kinds of impacts that were being discussed under both of the previous village center rezonings. Thank you. And do either of you want to uh, speak about um, Ms. Adams' point about the, the various districts all being all, all being part of these and uh, whether or not they could be disconnected? Um, so th the way to do that would be to create a new zone, which is what we tried to do before. We tried to create a new zone called NABC. Now, maybe maybe we had the dimensions, maybe we had the boundaries wrong. Um, but but um, right now, COM is COM, and, 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 and it exists in, in a few places in town. Um, we couldn't we couldn't break off w one com from another com unless we created a new zone. That's not what that's not what we're doing here. Right. Uh, for the comment by select board, Mr. Hayden, and then Mr. Wall. You suggested that um, this is an incremental change, and you know we're hoping it's going to have an incremental effect. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you imagine it's going to be enough. Um, as you know, there's a little bit of a housing crisis. I, I'm not, not going to call it a housing crisis. I'm going to call it a neighborhood crisis going on um, where, um, you know, this type of occupancy is ending up in places where it really doesn't um, support high-quality neighborhoods and family-based neighborhoods. Um, will this really help uh, move traffic and density um, out of our family neighborhoods and into places where we have the infrastructure. Um, really, I, I kind of, I see um, huge pressures on housing in town, and right now that pressure is being relieved, relieved in a way which is inappropriate. Um, and will this help? I think it'll help. Whether, whether it will solve it, I, I'm, I'm not going to claim that. Um, that's, that's too difficult to say. But, but um, the the press of demand drives up the cost, and that and that prices people out. It, it both it both makes um, some houses um, too too tempting to sell and too hard to buy. So um, so if you have a greater supply, um, I, I, I imagine that the cost will go down, and it'll be more economical for people to stay in neighborhoods and not turn them over to somebody else. And Mr. Wald. Yeah, thank you again, that was very helpful. And I think Mr. Tucker's point about the, the state law and zoning is, is well, uh, well taken. Uh, it, it seems problematic always to have one particular part of town or another one to exempt itself from a plan that's intended to be comprehensive because that's the nature of zoning. It's gotta be consistent. Uh, I'm also a little bit, I mean, I understand the fears because change is difficult and uncertainty, of course, causes stress and we've seen some very unfortunate developments in neighborhoods, so we don't want to repeat them. Uh, but I think right now we risk losing more by inaction than by action. Um, I noticed also, recalling the debate about North Amherst zoning last time, if I recall correctly, uh, people were so concerned in some cases about change that in the attempt to produce a compromise package in hopes of getting it passed, uh, areas that would have been down zoned to the west of Sunderland Road were put back into the current status because people felt the status quo was more comforting than change. The problem is calm lets you do some kind of ugly things. Uh, I live in North Amherst. I drive through these areas every day, and precisely what Mr. Crowner and Mr. and Mr. Tucker were saying is that we want to be avoiding here the all kind of strip mall development that has, you know, that's not a village center. That's ugly suburban sprawl when you've got large blocks of asphalt and parking, and then the structure is all commercial set back from the road. The other thing is that, uh, as the report of the planning board says, the current zoning for mixed use centers has not attracted desired businesses and other uses, in part because those uses require a critical mass of immediately adjacent residential customers. So it seems to me that the idea of loosening things, as you said very nicely, loosening up some requirements on dimensions, but tightening the requirements for character is very important. And the form-based codes are important there too, because as I understand it, the current zoning and the combination of the current zoning with uh, lot coverage and, and heights and so forth encourages people in commercial areas to put in lots of rectangular buildings with flat roofs. And what we're doing here is producing a more vernacular style in keeping with New England farmhouse. So it's more in keeping with the aesthetic and historic character of the neighborhood 
and it encourages mixed-use residential small units. And we're not allowing townhouses, we're not allowing apartments, we're not putting in student slums. So uh, I understand some of the concerns, but it seems to me that the measure, which again passed unanimously the planning board, is reasonably well crafted and offers probably the best chance we have to fix some of these problems now and not, not let them get worse. Mr. Eden. Just a request um, of your presentation. I'm looking at the, the red <coughs> up in uh, North Amherst, sort of with an eye towards uh, the earlier comment we had about appropriateness. <laughs> and um, I'm recalling one um, meeting that I attended where there was um, a, a nice, I, I would call it an overlay, except that's a technical term that you use all kind of, uh, uh, a graphic that showed which part of that was, um, had building restrictions on it, um, either because it's already in uh, farmland protection or it's in um, floodplain uh, flood and, um, what, uh, well, not only floodplain, but conservation. There's a, there's a number of, mm -hmm. um, 50-foot resource areas mm -hmm. and 100-foot buffers that have to be observed, which do significantly reduce that part of the triangle. So just suggestion. Yes, so a long range goal would be to change the boundaries there so that it actually more closely reflects what's actually possible. It, it's not gonna be possible to develop every square inch of that red spot, it's not. Ms. Poof. So this is awkward, but maybe somebody else can help me reword it somehow. Unfortunately, Ms. Perot had to leave, and I want to think about something that I thought I heard her say that I'm not, and I don't want to misspeak for her or speak for her. It's just that if someone else understands the concept behind it, because it came up at the planning board uh, hearing, that maybe it will become clearer to me what we're talking about. When I look at, well, first, you know, I look at this, which is in the back of the room, and that we had on our desk tonight with the two reds above and below the river, north and south of the river. And then when I look at the page that says North Amherst Mixed Use Districts North, which is mostly above the river and a little bit of south of the river is shown there. What I thought I heard said earlier is North is rural, South is where the amenities are. But North may be rural seeming, but it has a huge area of commercial zoning that hasn't been successful the way we expected in terms of commercial zoning. So arguably, you know, were one to turn back the clock 30 or 50 years, one might not have zoned it commercial, one would have thought of something else. But, and that was your reference previously to malls or a heavy industry. But the fact that it is currently not a mall or heavy industry doesn't, the fact that it's failed commercial doesn't make it rural. Isn't that true? And that Village Center is what we have south of the river. So it's not like it's two sets of commercial and we like the north commercial and not the south commercial. It's that it's not very commercial <laughs> north of the river. And what south of the river is where what limited business, you know, people go to the post office and go to the convenience store is right there. So I'm having a little trouble with the way some of the arguments are being framed in terms of what I would expect a map to look like based on what certain comments are. And so... Um, I'm just a little confused. So if you have anything to add to that that would be helpful, that'd be great. Um, I, I don't, I think, I think you said it well. That, that it's, it is, it, it's, it is um, difficult to, to, to really uh, understand it completely and, 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 and it's, you can easily see things in different ways depending on which direction you're looking and which, you know, what color glasses you are and, and so on, so. Uh, Mr. Tucker and then Mr. Wall. Partly because aspects of that question have been floating around. We, I checked the uh, our archives of uh, our zoning archives uh, this afternoon and found that in 1958, uh, this whole area, including the area west of Montague Road, was zoned for manufacturing, and it uh, basically allowed everything under the sun. And it wasn't until 1962 that the current, more or less current commercial district with that uh, boundary line uh, pulled back from uh, Montague Road came into play. And most of the dimensions, including floors, three floors, and most uh, of the use 
categories have been uh, consistent and remained the same since. 55 years, just about, of no change and not very successful uh, implementation of the zoning in, in terms of business activity. So it, it's overdue for a change. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wald? Yes, if just Mr. Tucker and Mr. Crowner could clarify something. We don't want to go back and, and go through all the old failed attempts, but maybe you could just speak briefly to this. Now, as I recall, quite well, in fact, a lot of the concerns were about that strip on Montague Road, and that's is that residential. That is not touched by this. And could you then clarify the difference, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, between the initial proposed rezoning for NAVC, the North Amateur Village Center, and the proposal here? This is a lot less intense, as I understand it. It's okay. It's I would say it's less intense in, in two ways, or it's it's it, it, the intensity is changed in different in two ways. One is that um, um, we're leaving leaving the comm uses intact. We're, we're changing how flexible they they can be, but leaving the comm uses intact, not adding um, the strictly residential uses that that we had originally proposed um, last year or two years ago. Um, the other way that it's that uh, intensity is affected is 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 in the boundaries. Um, the the boundary along Montague Road stays the same as as our ultimate um, proposal last year. Um, but we we had, we did also propose uh, moving the com east away from 116 away from the river. Um, that's not affected by this proposal. So technically, that still will be calm all the way to 116. Um, it, well, it, regardless of whether this passes or not, that's going to be calm. Right. <laughs> um, it, it, it's just a matter of, of how flexible the, the use of that land is. Thank you. Okay, select board need other comment or question before we're ready to take a position. All right, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board recommend the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting Article 31 zoning mixed use building standards and conditions. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. All right, next up is 32, mixed use center dimensions. Okay, uh, 32 is uh, changing the uh, dimensional table for, for the business zones for the mixed use centers. Um, and by the way, we're, that's, we're referring to them as, as mixed-use centers. I mean, there, there are business zones, all of our business zones, all the ones that start with B um, plus COM. Um, and what we're doing here is, is changing some of the d dimensions, making them a little bit more flexible, um, and at the same time introducing um, what was before in, in the form-based design, form-based code section of, of the proposals that we had in previous years. Um, so we're, for BL and COM, we're, we're proposing to reduce the minimum lot area required for, for residential units. Um, for, for each of the zones, we're, we're proposing to substitute a range of setbacks, both a minimum and maximum, instead of just a minimum. We're adding uh, footnote A, which allows the permanent granting body to modify the zone, modify the dimension for for a number of of the uh, dimensional th things there, uh, building coverage, um, most particularly uh, maximum building coverage. Um, so we're not changing we're not changing the default. We're not changing it from 35 or 70, um, but we're allowing the permit granting body, in, in most cases it would be the, the special permit granting body, um, to change it if, if it fits in the context of the surrounding neighborhood. And we're also um, substituting a maximum height with a range that goes from a minimum to a maximum. We want a, um, buildings to be um, both a certain height and, um, and not exceed a certain height. We want, we want to create a streetscape, we want to create a, uh, a street envelope that, that is, um, you know, encloses the street and, uh, and makes, makes it a, a place where people want to be. So 
so that's what part of this article does. The second part is, uh, as Mr. Tucker says, it, it adds footnote B to the uh, lot area requirements for BL and common. That's pretty important. That's, that's where um, that regulates the number of units that are possible on a lot more so than, than anything else. It's, it's, if you have, as it stands right now, if you have, um, if you are allowed to do six units on a lot, you, you would need an acre, a lot of an acre in order to, for that. That means that you have a, a, a one building um, with six units in it on an acre of land and you can't have another building there. That's, it's, it's, a, it's not an efficient use of, of the land. So we're, we're suggesting that um, the lot size be taken away and, and, and regulated strictly by um, the permit, how many units you can have, the size of the building and, and the permit. Um, and finally, uh, we're, we're proposing to change how we measure uh, the height of a building. Right now, uh, we measure height by the, the highest point on the roof. Unfortunately, that means that um, uh, sloped roofs <coughs> do not have the capacity um, that, they, that they might otherwise have, and so it, it, it uh, sort of encourages against uh, New England-style pitched roofs, uh, encourages in favor of flat roofs. Um, that's not as friendly looking. It's not um, interesting. So we, we'd like to promote uh, pitched roofs, and so we're suggesting that uh, roofs be measured by the midpoint of the top, the highest point of the of the main ridge line, and the lowest point. That's a standard way of measuring height in many other places, and so we're just adopting it in Amherst, or we're proposing to adopt it in Amherst. Um, and that's uh, in section six. Point one nine that that's uh, referred to in, in the uh, dimensional table. Thank you. Questions or comments for Mr. Croner on Article Thirty Two, Mr. Eden. Yeah, I'm going to ask. Maybe this is going to be the repeated question. Uh, what in, in your public hearings? What came up in um, as responses and concerns with this? Um, it's the same thing. It's it's um, it, it's what impact will it have on the business mixed use business zone that's near me I mean how, how much how much more residential use is going to happen as a result of, of these proposed changes um, I think the the changes to the act to the dimensional table itself um, are are not very big They're, those are those are small changes um, again where where the impact is is in footnote B that 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 takes away the the lot size requirements for residential use. Um. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I'm going to recall from my planning board days that sometimes it's a small change that gets you un under the threshold or over the threshold to the big change that you're, you're looking for. So I understand that. Other select board questions or comments? Ms. Poor. <laughs> I actually like the small thing of the roof situation because I, flat roofs not only, uh, I'm not as in some ways even as entranced by the appearance, but just the necessity of having to maintain a flat roof just so it just seems like an unfortunate consequence of what the way we were doing it before, mm -hmm. whereas not only do we like the way they look better, it's a lot better to maintain, so good on us. Yeah, we have <laughs> some architects on the planning board who pointed that out to us. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions and comments from the Select Board? Mr. Wall. At the risk of a digression, I want to speak out in favor of flat roofs in general. <laughs> the Nazis denounced them as, as alien Arab architecture and <laughs> thought the pitch roof was the ultimate in German culture. So uh, <laughs> these debates change from context to context. Uh, no, I, I, I occasionally regret the fact there isn't more modern architecture in Amherst, but I think here where we're trying to make things fit, there's a logic for it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want people to get the impression that a flat roof is entirely bad because we have green flat roofs and we have gardens and things like that. So. I hope that we still have room for flat roofs in Amherst. Yeah, so they're not not prohibited. It's just, it's just allowing more flexibility. Yep. Other questions or comments from Select Board? All right, anyone from the public like to comment on Article 32? Ms. Kelly. Um, 
So this is new information or specific to 32, right? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> So, uh, Janet Keller, Precinct 1, and I want to point out a few important points here. Um, the first is that um, if someone can show me that my math is off, I'll be glad to um, step back from this. But my assessment of these changes is that they are decidedly non-trivial. So for example, um, let me pull this back up here. Um, I've got a lot of paper. I've been working on this and uh, uh, this is the guy I want. So the mixed-use center dimensions, as you know, we do have this big section of red commercial area in the center of uh, North Amherst. Um, and what this rezoning does is allow higher buildings on much smaller lots, as I do the math now. Um, 63% less lot space for each added family. 58% less frontage, 66% shallower setback. Cut the minimum lot size from 20,000 square feet to 15,000. Um, and the added lot area per family from 4,000 square feet to 25,000. Cut the minimum lot frontage by 50% from 125 to 60 feet. Minimum setback from 50 by 50% from 20 to 10, I appreciate the minimum, um, minimum maximum, that flexibility, I think that reasoning makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and also raising the height, but that doesn't trouble me and I like the peaked roofs as well. I think they're more functional, I think they look better, I think it's a great idea. Um, so I, I want to emphasize that um, sometimes I feel like North Amherst is Rodney Dangerfield. Don't get no respect. Um, and we in North Amherst are not afraid of change. And we are for appropriate change that does not put out of scale, inappropriate uses cheek by jowl with multi-generational neighborhoods, farms, floodplains, wetlands, and unprotected historic resources. These are our assets. They're looking a little shabby right now, but they can look a lot better. And packing in more housing, um, I uh, don't feel um, is going to help us. In regard to the ruralness or not ruralness of North Amherst, um, it's 60% low density despite um, the stuff on, on Meadow Street um, and south. Um, when you come from Meadow Street north, um, that area is 60% low density. It's either RN, which is a reasonably low density um, uh, residential neighborhood zoning, um, RO, rural outline, residential outline, or residential low density. In fact, um, the uh, residential low density is the lowest density um, category. And um, I want to caution that while the land that's permanently protected for farmland, we have some um, farmland that the town has identified as um, farmland conservation. I believe that's the right term. Um, that's unprotected, as are, um, and I think we should not be sanguine about the protections for wetlands and floodplains either. They are regulated. They are not protected absolutely. So, um, I guess those are the things I want to say. Um, the um, article is the 
um, 32 is designed to be somewhat separable. BL and um, COM are one set of, uh, of uh, regulate separately um, separate dimensions. Business, uh, general business has a, a separate set, as does business village center. So um, this has been described as incremental change. There is the opportunity if one wanted to work with us, and we are, I want to reiterate, we're not against change. We are, stand fully ready to support appropriate change for our neighborhood. Um, so um, those parts, um, commercial and business, um, limited business, could be separated out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions or comments from the public on Article 32? Okay. Um, Mr. Crowner, anything else you'd like to add? Or? No, we're good. Um, okay, select board, raise any other questions or comments from this, Ms. Radin? Just, just um, 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 as you were crafting the, the minimums and the maximums and the heights and, and everything else, uh, what were the range of values you considered? Was there one? Did you, did you push and pull at at these things? Um, so, so we are proposing actually to raise the maximum on, on in some of the zones, um, and we d I think we discussed up to. 45 feet in in the comm zone at one point, but we decided to, to just go up by five feet at this point. Um, really, uh, we're not changing the number of floors. So the floors stay the same. It's just it's just um, how easy it is to, to build three floors, how easy it is to you know, put the infrastructure into the air conditioning and, and all that kind of stuff that, that goes into a building nowadays um, in, in, the, in the height range that, that is now allowed. Um, so um, yeah, we did look. We did look at, at at substantially larger, and we decided not not to go um, too much larger. Thank you. Other questions or comments from select board, Mr. Wall. Again, just to clarify, as so I understood it, reading your report and the article, there are several purposes for doing that, and one again is to encourage not building more boxy buildings, and providing upper stories that can be used for multiple purposes. And we also mentioned the solar placement, right? So. I mean, it, it seems to me a five-foot increase is not a terribly drastic thing, but it actually produces a lot more benefit than you expect for an incremental change, if we look at it from that perspective, that is aesthetics plus sustainability. Is that a fair reading of the, the article? Thank you. Other questions or comments from Select Board? All right, if we are ready to make a recommendation, Ms. Stein. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 32, zoning, mixed use, center dimensions. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. Okay, it goes to 33. Okay, so we'll, we'll go to 33. We're not, we'll leave off 35 for now. 33, um, this is a, this article was, was requested by town staff, specifically the building commissioner. Um, and what it is is an attempt to rationalize the permitting of non-conforming properties in business zones so that unnecessary or duplicate hearings need not be held and so that non-conforming properties in business zones are treated similarly to the way non-conforming properties in residential zones are treated. I'm, I have to read this because it's I understand what it is, but it's it, it, it's very uh, tongue-tying. So uh, I think Mr. Tucker can say it from memory, but no one else can. Um, <laughs> so there are, there are two ways in which a property can be non-conforming. It can be non-conforming dimensionally, or it can be non-conforming uh, by use. Um, and when it, when when a change is proposed to such a property that is non-conforming in some way, it, it requires a special permit. Even when uh, the nonconformity is not itself being affected. And so this, this creates bureaucracy, it creates slowdowns, um, and it's not, it's not really necessary. What we're suggesting is that um, the building commissioner be empowered to grant a permit for a structural alteration of a dimensionally nonconforming building in a business zone, provided that alteration does not exacerbate the nonconformity or create a new one. 
just as he currently is for non-conforming residences. We passed that five or six years ago, I think. So this avoids an unnecessary special permit hearing. And as part of this uh, enumeration of authority, we're also clarifying that a structural alteration involves the exterior of a building. So if it's interior, it doesn't even come up. For a dimensionally non-conforming building in which no structural alteration is proposed in conjunction with a new or expanded use that is conforming, no special permit would be required, just the site plan review or whatever else is applicable. For a change that would otherwise require hearings before both the planning board and the ZBA, because the use is allowed but a dimensional nonconformity is proposed or exacerbated, the planning board would hear both the site plan review and the special permit, avoiding competing permit processes as town meeting has approved in a number of other situations in recent years. So the ZBA would still hear proposals in which just a, non a dimensional nonconformity is proposed or exacerbated or when one non-conforming use changes to another non-conforming use that is similar in character and impact. So we're just trying to uh, reduce the unnecessary um, workload without, um, without relieving uh, the oversight that, that is necessary. It's just, we're just putting it in the proper place. Thank you. Makes good sense. Questions or comments from Select Board? Mr. Hayden. Did you hear from representatives at the ZBA in, in the discussion on this? Um, we did this a long time ago. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't specifically remember whether the representative from ZBA was there. Could you? Uh, the ZBA was had an administrative meeting uh, during this period and discussed uh, the zoning articles that were then under development. They were aware of this. Uh, they were also invited to the public hearing, and uh, there's a a ZBA representative who regularly attends the zoning subcommittee meetings, the meetings of the subcommittee of the planning board that works on zoning, so that they were aware of this all along. Uh, these changes were principally requested by the building commissioner as a way of straightening out uh, ways in which the nonconforming regulations don't work now. Um, all, in fact, almost all of these changes were uh, intended to do that. Um, Again, one of those intentions in more than one kind of circumstance is to try and prevent a circumstance arising where you have, in order for someone to get a single zoning permit in order to operate a use, they have to go to two boards. That, that just doesn't make sense. And uh, town meeting has been uh, adopting amendments to do away with that for more than 10 years as we run into them. Thank you. Ms. Brewer. Um, based on your large archive that's up here, Mr. Tucker, in addition to in your paper files, um, could you give us an example that does one come to mind of something where, you know, in the fairly recent past, I mean, you know, within the last 25 or 30 years, where, so, where some, somebody had to go through this process and this is what ended up happening? Uh, what has happened is that uh, we discovered several things at, at once as a consequence of having a new and uh, highly competent building commissioner. He was going to uh, require that uh, things go to two boards. He had, or is prepared to if um, these, these changes are not passed. What we have discovered is uh, over the years, because most of our centers are, were built long before zoning came about, almost all of the buildings, for instance, in the downtown here are non-conforming dimensionally in one way or another. And a, a series of building commissioners has, over time, simply ignored that. And unless there was something happening that was creating a new nonconformity, mm -hmm. they just uh, didn't pay any attention to that in the process. On the other hand, in residential neighborhoods where everybody is watching things very carefully about what's going on in their, their vicinity, uh, it was almost always the case that any nonconformity required a special permit process in addition to whatever use permit may have been required. And that was why the current provision uh, allowing the building commissioner in three different kinds of instances where no nonconformity is being exacerbated to make an administrative decision that, that those kinds of things can go ahead was added about eight or ten years ago to the bylaw. Uh, when our new building commissioner took a look at the situation, well, over here we've got one practice, 
And over here, we've got an entirely different practice. That's not fair to everybody. Part of the reason for requesting uh, these amendments was to make the practice continuous across everything. He also, uh, although we don't, we didn't have a specific example of this. He did not want to have uh, situations in the downtown, in the process of trying to apply things fairly, where you had a use that was going in a retail store or something. It was going into a building that was non-conforming and nothing was changing on the exterior of the building, but he was going to have to send them to the CBA for a special permit because the building was non-conforming. So that, this is an attempt to fix all of those floating bits and pieces that have not been resolved previously. Thank you. Other questions or comments from Select Board? Ms. Hayden. Can you comment on how this is going to change the workload of the uh, Planning Board and the Planning Department and the Zoning Board of Appeals? Well, it will streamline the process. Uh, unless, if we have circumstances where somebody has to go to two different boards, that's twice as much process, that's twice as many public hearings, twice as many night meetings. Um, if it's all being done by the same board that's issuing the permit for the use in those instances where you need to have uh, a special permit because something is happening with the nonconformity, um, then it can be combined into a single hearing and done all at once by that one body. Also, by adding the, the three criteria under which no such review is required. We are relieving uh, everybody of, of the work involved and in going forward with a special permit on that. Other questions or comments from Select Board? Questions or comments from the public? Well, uh, Ms. Keller. <laughs> Janet Keller, Precinct 1. I just want to state that I have a lingering concern here with the loosening uh, of the regulations through the buy right site plan. Um, regulations and laws are not for most of us, not for the people in this room. They're for the outliers who lack the capacity or the will to conform to good building practices when they're tempted by some extra profit. And so it's very worrisome to me when <coughs> we loosen those requirements. And I, that's the main point I'd like to make. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from Select Board? Mr. Crowner and Mr. Tucker. Um, so this is not intended to, to relieve uh, the need for a special for a special permit hearing when, when that is necessary. Um, it might mean that a different body hears the special permit, but if a special permit is is going to be necessary, it's it's going to be necessary. We're saying that it's it shouldn't be necessary when there's when there's no significant change. Um, it's just it's just a, a, the way the bylaw is written. Um, if it's non-conforming, that it automatically means special permit, even if it even if that doesn't make sense. So so I, I agree. Um, we definitely do not want to loosen the oversight where, where, it's, where it's necessary, and, and I don't think that's what we're doing. Thank you. All right, the select board ready to make a recommendation on this article. All right, Ms. Stein. I move to rec that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting Article 33, zoning nonconforming uses and structures. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Next up, we have 34. 34 is um, a very simple change to the dimensional table for a single zone, the RF zone, for the purpose of, of increasing uh, flexibility of interpretation of, of this zone. Um, the RF zone exists in two places in town. One is on Olympia Drive, as most people know. Um, the other actually is r is right on campus, on, on North Pleasant Street, um, the Newman Center, and the two um, fraternities that are north of that are privately owned and are in our RF zone, which means they, c they could be 
developed by anyone. Um, and they're not university property. However, the, the, R, the dimensional table for, for the RF zone is really geared toward the Olympia Drive uh, locations. And so it, it doesn't allow a, a, a very high intensity use that might be possible on the RF zone that is within the university. We'd like to make it possible for uh, someone to potentially redevelop the university, um, the North Pleasant Street RF zone into uh, potentially uh, high density student housing that, that would conform to what already exists around it in campus. So we're proposing to add footnote A to the building coverage, lot coverage, and maximum height dimensions for the RF zone only. And again, footnote A allows the special permit granting body, a special permit, to modify those dimensions to conform to the uh, existing neighborhood. In this case, the existing neighborhood on North Pleasant Street is a university, and there are five and six-story buildings. There are, there are new modern buildings all over the place, um, uh, high lot coverage and so on. Um, it doesn't mean that we want that kind of building in on Olympia Drive necessarily, and um, the permit granting body should not interpret it such. They should they should be looking at the context of the neighborhood, and the context of the neighborhood there is is um, more rural. So it's not a blanket coverage. It's, it's just allowing flexibility. Questions or comments from Slackley? Yes, I just have a technical issue. Does anyone have another copy of 34? I seem to have gotten two 35s and no 34, and I would like ah. to have a 34. I didn't bring my hard copies. I'm sorry. No, These are ones on that were table. on the table tonight. Oh, they don't give me hard copies on the table. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You can have an extra one. No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but not I'd like problem. to have it in front of me while we're talking. So. Bottom line, this is allowing private property on campus to potentially be redeveloped as dense student housing. Right. This is the holy grail. This is right. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Questions or comments about this? Anyone? Mr. Eden. Um, we've we've um, visited a number of fraternities recently uh, for a number of functions and have learned um, through those events and, and also just in, in interacting with the students in fraternities um, about um, the general rules that um, they have for their conduct in, in, in our neighborhood. Um, I don't know that all frats and sororities um, behave that way. Um, I'm wondering if um, there's some part of this um, that encourages that type of activity. Um, and, and I, I don't know how to be more articulate about that, but I'm really rather impressed with the, um, the frats that are right down on Fearing with their community service, with their um, designated driver policies, um, without which they would get kicked out of the, um, their national organization. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 can't, it can't address that. But, but I guess I should clarify, um, it doesn't, what is allowed in RF is not necessarily a fraternity or sorority. It also allows uh, social dormitories. So, um, so you can imagine a different kind of housing that, that allows um, individual rooms or, or something that, that a lot of people can live in, not necessarily a fraternity. So those are the only places you can put fraternities and sororities, but you could also put other right. things in those places. Mr. Tucker. Um, the majority of private student developments now, um, although not all, the majority uh, include private management because it is in the interest of the property owner over time to make sure that the property doesn't burn down, uh, <laughs> doesn't have nightly visits by the police and so forth. So that is an increasing, um, increasingly standard feature of those kinds of developments. Now depending on what kind of development it is, that, that may vary. but. Um, that is a increasing feature of these things. Thank you. All right, uh, select board, any other questions or comments about this? Public, any questions or comments about this? All right, Ms. Uh, Ms. Brewer. 
since it's in the mailing that will be in the next town meeting mailing, I'm presuming we've just made the deadline for that on Article 34. Um, could you characterize for us the two excerpts from the campus master plan? I appreciate it's designated that you know, these circles are for the Newman Area Center, but the red properties versus the brown properties, this is, um, this is something that people who are not particularly familiar with the campus master plan might be rather surprised by. Uh, there are uh, two maps in, in the report. Uh, the first one, which says UMass Amherst campus master plan and then Newman Air Center uh, area circled, the brown buildings are existing mm -hmm. and the red buildings are proposed as part of the master plan. Then if you turn the page, there is a colored map that has a color code. Uh, and the color code corresponds to the key above talking about sort of groupings of different kinds of uses of land. Uh, this was included in part because it was a big enough plan to also show on Olympia Drive, right. but also it, it shows that the area along what is now Mass Ave uh, is shown in yellow and it is contiguous with the three properties along North Pleasant Street and yellow is residential. So this is a, you know, consistent with uh, the, mas the state master plan as well as uh, the town's needs. Thank you. Thank you. It was the perfect opportunity to get my jacket. Thank you, because it's freezing <laughs> in here. <laughs> okay. Uh, other questions or comments about this article? And then Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Sure. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting Article 34 zoning RF district dimensions. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. And 35. Okay, so 35 is, is the final part of our package. Um, it's This is more strictly uh, um, extending the, the, our form-based design guidelines for, for our zoning bylaw. This would add a new section to uh, Chapter 9 of the zoning bylaw, which deals with nonconforming uses and structures, um, which, by the way, 33 was also... Uh, adding significant new language to chapter nine. And this adds a new section to chapter nine, and it deals with um, where we want um, non-conforming non buildings uh, to be located on a property. So when, when there is a, an addition or an expansion or a, a new building on a non-conforming property, non-conforming for whatever reason, when it comes in for a special permit, we want it to, um, to conform to the Fun setback range that we uh, are proposing to establish in Article 32. And so that range is um, to bring buildings closer to the street, to start creating that streetscape, uh, to create uh, public space, to create a, a, a pedestrian way, um, and, and to, to start taking away the uh, tendency to put parking lots in front of, of buildings. Um, so that's that's a uh, one part of the dimensional table that we do not want to violate. We want to to uh, specifically enforce the fund setback requirement for uh, non-conforming buildings. And so this would apply to non-conforming buildings. Um, again, 32 would apply to new buildings. Um, this would apply to non-conforming non buildings um, when there's a, a change or addition to them. I should note. Um, the final paragraph, 9.313, allows for um, a special permit to, to waive that requirement in cases where safety or uh, aesthetics dictate that, it, that it's not really uh, worth doing or, or doesn't, wouldn't really work. So it's not a uh, 100% hard and fast rule. Um, it's, it's the default is, is we want you to come closer, but there is an escape valve if necessary. Thank you. Questions or comments from Select Board? Mr. Wall. And just to clarify for the viewing audience and others, this applies only to existing structures, as the word non-conforming implies. We're not talking about new construction or anything like that. Right. No new development. Right. Thank you. Other questions and comments from Select Board? Questions and comments from the public? Okay. That's an easy one. Ms. Stein. 
I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting article 35 zoning <coughs> locational requirements for non-conforming structures in mixed use centers. Second. Mr. Hayden. I oh, didn't ask my question because it's it's well documented the back of the, the package there what, what concerns were raised in the public hearing. So I appreciate that. Thank you. A further discussion, Ms. Spur. As it was in the other reports as well, it's just good to hear those well, highlights. I, had, yeah, I like I to hear those last highlights. Page, so the the other comment I was going to make is: Should we go ahead and have the secondary vote that reflects what planning board's vote was? If Article Thirty Two fails, that this is our alternate position on this is referral. Just so we remember. I mean, I don't know where we write that down appropriately for the, uh, you know, our backup plan. Okay. Mr. Croner. So I should explain that just, just in case people don't realize. Uh, this Article 35 refers to uh, the front setback range that we're trying to establish in 32. If it doesn't get established in 32, then it, then it doesn't really make sense to, to then go ahead with 35. So you would be moving to just yeah, refer, yeah. refer it. So. To take it back. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, you could probably incorporate that into the motion. Um, so by incorporation so or referral if yeah. 32 fails. Okay, Sounds further good. discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. that is unanimous. All right, so those are the, uh, thank, you. thank you. So those are the um, articles from the planning board. We just do have a zoning petition article and we have Mr. Gaidero, lead petitioner here to uh, talk to us about this. <coughs> Welcome, introduce hi, yourself thanks. for folks at home. Uh, my name is Jerry Gadera. I brought up uh, Article 36 as a uh, citizen petition, I guess it's called. Um, the purpose is, is pretty simple. Uh, I think that the summary, uh, and especially the recommendation of the planning board, gets to the point. Um, I guess I can provide you with some history of the, about the project. Um, we bought the land from Barry Roberts in, in January of 2008, um, along with the Henry Hills Mansion, the former Boys and Girls Club, we developed um, lots along Gray Street by relocating older homes and fixing them up. Um, and now we'd like to build a new headquarters for Amherst Media on the uh, Main Street lots. And uh, Amherst Media now has the right to do that through either special permit or site plan review, depending on how they go about it. But <coughs> this zoning change would facilitate that. Okay. Questions or comments from Select Board? Mr. Hayden, are you prepping to make a question? Or <laughs> well, I, I, um, I was just, I was, was wondering how be best to get at this, but I, I'm wondering if, if you can comment, and, and the planning folks have left, so, oh, uh, maybe we could get a comment on how it would affect that permit for the Amherst Media okay. headquarters. Sure, no, I mean, the, the greatest advantage of doing the zoning change, I mean, we're not doing the zoning change just for a purely uh, regulatory exercise here. Uh, the zoning change would give them greater flexibility, greater lot coverage. Um, uh, they would be able to build a uh, build out more on the land. Uh, specifically, what they need is more parking space. Uh, there's space available, of course, on Gray Street, and there are other areas. But this would make it easier for them to to reach their objective. At, at the town meeting, um, Jim Lesko from Amherst Media will talk about why they want that zoning change. But since it's specific to their needs, I just wanted to talk about mostly the zoning change and what it means. And so that's effectively the big difference, greater lot coverage. Thank you. Mr. Wall? Yeah, just, just briefly, this is obviously a, a history that goes back a number of years, <laughs> and a number of us have watched this very carefully. In fact, it was the beginning of moving of houses to those lots by Mr. Roberts when I was chairing the Historical Commission that brought out big crowds of the public who were very concerned about that and was ultimately concerned about this area that began the push for local historic districts to regulate inappropriate development. And I think we were generally satisfied, very satisfied with the way things actually turned out. Historic, we, I mean, many people would prefer the whole area to be kept undeveloped, but that wasn't, it was not zoned that way. It wasn't, that wasn't the end result. Uh, and the end result has been, I think people find satisfactory. Historically appropriate buildings were moved there. They were placed as far to the uh, north and then the east as possible to keep the viewscape for the historic mansions open. And so our concern about those two lots was that they would compromise the historic character of that property 
uh, in general and just in a physical sense block the view. Uh, I was, I wondered for example if there might be problems with spot zoning here and I looked at the definitions and consulted with town staff and I was assured that was not the case because this is being done uh, for the common good and in, in accordance with general planning principles. So I think that's not an objection. Uh, the other thing to, and I'm not making a judgment, I'm just trying to explain the background. Uh, the Historical Commission took this up on a number of occasions this past year, uh, most recently uh, just a week or so ago, and they decided not to take a position. They thought it was sufficiently addressed by planning and others. I think one thing to bear in mind, regardless of whether one is for or against it, is that under the current zoning, and Mr. Gadair knows better than I do, he can put up two buildings on those lots and there's not a lot of regulation over them except when the district comes in. So as I understand it, again, correct me if I'm wrong, the proposal before us would more likely result in, in the, the intensification of use would allow for an appropriate structure to be built on the north, on the easternmost lot, leaving the second lot to the west probably open or at least not develop to the same height. Right, and I thereby mean preserving the view, is that correct? Or the, the only argument you're gonna hear from people really that I've heard at least, is that people would prefer to have these remain open vacant lots, and that's just not an option. That's, there's no option C here. Right now there's only two residential buildings and lots, as you know. In fact, many people don't know, we actually got an offer at one point when we had it uh, from investor, uh, real estate investors that wanted to turn it into two single family homes and then go before the ZBA, get special permits and pack it uh, with as many people as possible. And so we turned that down because we had a longer vision for this. We took us, you know, what, five years to find the right partner at Samaris Media. Once we have a structure built as far to the corner of Gray and Main as possible, those, lo those lots will be occupied. So it won't be expanded and will actually secure the view of the Hills House to as much an extent as possible. The question is how do we go about it? Uh, do we go about it through finding the right partner, which is Amherst Media, it's an invested uh, organization here that's got an interest in, in being in a good spot and looking good. And I think we're developers with a proven track record of having done that. And that's basically why we think this is a good combination. Thank you. Other questions or comments from Select Board? I was, I was uh, Ms. Stein. Um, I, I like the buildings you put up on the Gray Street and, and very much, but it does really concern me how this new project would maintain a view at all. Um, what would it be, over the parking lot or what? Right, I mean, what the parking lot would presumably be uh, somewhat sunken because there's a s significant slope up and grade up to the Hills House. It would be uh, obscured presumably by a hedge. And I say presumably because this would be the first test case really for the Dickinson Historic District, which is created as part of that uh, local historic district study committee. And so it would really be up to the Dickinson the Historic District to define the parameters of this building within uh, building code. So, you know, we can't do five stories because the, the zoning doesn't allow for that. Uh, but we may not, we may have to build it in a certain style um, that reflects the rest of Gray Street, for example. And that's, those are the questions that would be addressed by, um, by the uh, local historic district. Um, so the parking lot in particular, the idea right now that we've tossed around with Amherst Media, and by the way, uh, you know, we don't have a f signed p agreement with Amherst Media to do this. This is just an agreement that we have in place. Um, and either they will buy the lots and build it themselves, or we maybe we can arrange something where they'll lease them back, like what the, the folks for the Amherst Cinema did. Um, but the idea is to build the lot, build the building as far to the corner of Gray and Main as possible, and the parking on the other side. And so that would maintain the view, because once you have a structure covered, then that would maximize the lot coverage right there. So you can't build on top of a parking lot. Mr. Hayden. I would just point out that Mr. Gudera's presumption that there would be a hedge uh, shielding the parking lot um, is predicated on uh, applying current zoning bylaw, which requires it. Say it again, Aaron. It, it requires Hedges are required around parking lots by bylaw, by existing zoning bylaw. Other questions or comments from Select Board? Mr. Wall? Yeah, as I understand it, a parking lot is definitely part of your plan? Yeah. It's considered desirable, I imagine, for the reasons of Amherst Media along with the public transit, but there's, that's pretty much a given, or is there an option that would not involve parking there? Uh, I think that would be negotiated as part of the discussions with the uh, local historic district. Um, if we are able to do the zoning change, we would be allowed to have, if we maximized the usage, uh, more spaces than under the current zoning. Um, 
we've designed some plans for them based on the current zoning, which would require them to either do a special permit or, or you know, let's say plan review. Um, and those have, let's say, I don't know, 15, just to pick a number of spots. Um, the new change would give us 20 spots instead. These are just, I'm just using these as uh, numbers, not really actual spaces. Other questions or comments from select board? All right, let's see if uh, Mr. Crowner, would you like to come forward and uh, give some comments on planning board and maybe take some questions on oh planning board position? Here. So uh, planning board uh, supports this zoning change. Um, I should point out that that the proposal actually is a zoning change. It's not a proposal for Amherst Media. It's a proposal for zoning change. And so, so the question is, is is BN appropriate for this um, part of town, for this area on the street? And and it was the opinion of the planning board that it, in fact it was. Um, it uh, we very recently um, did a major rezoning of that area of town. And so, so there's a business village center across the street from it. Farther east along Main Street is is more BN zone. Um, the BN zone is <coughs> allows for um, it, it's a it's a softer village center type zone. It it allows some uses of uh, business uses, retail, and so on that that are um, desirable for uh, nearby neighbors. But it, but it has limitations on, on time and um, number of employees in general. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a good buffer for uh, a residential zone uh, and, and a business zone. So we, we think it's a good idea uh, regardless of, of who actually uses the property. Um, could I just a ask follow-up and might have more follow-ups? Um, when you were originally doing the, the change zoning a couple of years ago, why didn't the boundary include that at, at that point? Um, I wasn't part of the planning board at that time, so I don't I don't remember w what the reason was. Um, I suspect because um, because of the, at the time the rest of that lot was not developed, and so it was it was thought of more as as you know this is a residential area, um, and we weren't trying to um, create a, a a business area on that part of of Main Street. Now that that development has happened there, and and it's nice and it's good. Um, and and it's and it's not as as threatening as as people may have thought. Why not? Why not um, take it the next step and and, f and finish it off there and and, and, and you know finish something really nice. Uh, Mr. Hayden, then Mr. yeah, Wall. I just wanted to recall that um, the BN zone um, came into being specifically um, to respect the um, uh, the properties of that neighborhood. The kind of uh, transition between, you know, the downtown and, uh, you know, uh, the, the first, in fact, the first residential development uh, in the town of Amherst. Thank you. Mr. Wild, did you have your hand raised? No, I'm sorry. Ms. Brewer? I just wanted to reiterate something that was stated earlier associated with um, some of the history, which is that although it took me a little while to get my head around it because I'm always talking about having more housing units, um, I'm actually pleased about the fact that by the converting it to BN, that single family house is not po possible there because because of the possibilities of what could go wrong if it became if those were single family houses as opposed to businesses fitting in so nicely along that way and across the area so it actually seems very logical to me to take away the ability to have those be single family homes thank you mr Gadare, you had another comment yeah, I, I just wanted to mention Part of the reason that when that zoning change took effect, I think it was in 09, was that I started having discussions with the planning um, department here about rezoning our building at 446 Main Street. Um, and we discussed the possibility of adding the two uh, front lots from the uh, Hills House project to that rezoning as BN initially then, but it was considered politically unpalatable given that um, we hadn't worked on the project yet at the time and people didn't know what was gonna happen. Uh, and the separation of the, the the chopping up of the hills land into six lots was already causing a lot of strife. So really, it was just a question of, um, from what I recall from our discussion with the planning uh, department, that it was a question of what makes sense at the time. Uh, but again, the idea of the business neighborhood is that it acts as a, as a buffer, as a collar around the business village center. Uh, I think it's worked out well. Um, 
in the last few years of the buildings that were affected by those changes. And you know, we see things like the lumber yard going across the street and the, and the hot tub and before that wonder arts, those were all created after the zoning changes. So it, it did effectively encourage what we want zoning to do, which is a particular type of development, whether it's um, housing for students or uh, in this case, businesses. Thank you. So this is a real uh, uh, an entry area to our downtown, and uh, it, it, I think it sounds like the plan, which is a zoning plan, but a zoning plan that specifically has a development uh, potential attached to it, uh, it is a is a good one and make for a very positive entry to the downtown, and particularly something that is uh, right next to uh, Emily Dickinson's homestead. So, um, other questions or comments from select board? Questions or comments from the public? Mr. Greenbaum. My name is Louis Greenbaum, and I live in Precinct Number One. Um, <clears throat> I still struggle a little bit, incidentally, with the hearing and the acoustics um, and the PA system. So, if I may possibly have repeated something that I didn't hear, I hope you'll excuse me. Um, the one thing that we have not weighed in our discussion and the evaluation of this proposal is that we are dealing with the historical district. We are dealing with two extraordinarily important properties in the history of the town of Amherst. The Hillses, by the midpoint of the 19th century, were the richest people in Amherst. Uh, they built those two magnificent mansions that still sit there. And thanks very largely to the clearing of the lots, you can get some sense of the grandeur uh, the majesty, nearly, certainly the opulence of the architecture, the design, and the ultimate creation of two beautiful houses on a magnificent setting. Don't forget his house was built on a lot of 2.8 acres. Um, I would like to appeal to the select board to not grant the commercial zoning that is being requested. Uh, it just so happens that the first buyer of that property took what was nearly three acres and a single lot and created six lots in its place. That in a historical district is absolutely unprecedented. I don't know of anything like that that ever occurred in the town of Amherst. Uh, five of those were frontage lots. The sixth was actually where the mansion sits today which no longer has its egress. It always had a Main Street address. It has now a Gray Street address. But that's less important than what we're prepared to do in order to honor uh, the presence of this great family. They were the people who brought the Industrial Revolution to the town of Amherst. They were extraordinarily generous, not merely as employers, but also as citizens of this town. They helped financially for the founding of the University of Massachusetts, which is now 150 years old, celebrating this year. It has a score, uh, and even more, of benevolent and generous gifts and donations which it made, including utilities and public, public services for the town of Amherst and its citizens. We have an obligation to remember those people. We have something of a duty to acknowledge their presence by dint of respecting the houses which they had built, which also reminds us, incidentally, of the public mindedness and the services which they rendered to the entire community. What we did in providing the three frontage lots on Gray Street was to move three historical buildings onto an area which one might almost be tempted to say nowadays fits in beautifully well, almost like those houses that had always been there. And that is due, I think, to the success of a whole host of factors. But I think we could live with that. I don't think we can live with the possibility of the erection of a business of whatever sort and whatever service facilities and parking go with it. That would be a defacing and I think it would also be a repudiation of what a historical 
uh, uh, district means to accomplish. And if I may appeal to the Board of Selectmen, largely as the people whom we can favor uh, as assuring something of the continuity, something of the heritage, something of the history that went on and continues. And, uh, and our reverence, our respect, as I mentioned before, for these buildings. The Historical Commission, and I was proud to be a member at the time, thought that we had had an excellent uh, solution to the problem of being able to maintain the integrity of the land and the building. And that is to offer a sum of money under CPAC, which was approved by the town meeting and which uh, the owner, Mr. Guidera, found fit not to accept. I still have the hope that maybe he might be disposed to doing that one day. But if that fails, please do not permit the whole transformation of the use and therefore the appearance uh, of uh, what remains on the land, the two frontage lots in Main Street, which people enjoy, which become part of the fabric of the enjoyment of one of Amherst's great historical neighborhoods. Please keep in mind that our voting not to permit commercial development does not leave the owner of that land without options. He can erect houses. And um, he presented before the uh, Historical Commission a schema of houses that I think would fit beautifully on the lot, which be, would be thoroughly in conformity with the buildings that already exist. And nevertheless, which have the one guarantee, and that is through the control uh, and through the permission which is accorded by the local historical commission. Thank you very much. Uh, we have that, and I have faith in that but I'm afraid if we go ahead with the commercials only, we've lost all opportunities of being able to have the retention and the continuity of what you can look at and still admire with pride some of the great historical buildings and monuments of our town. Thank you very much, Mr. Greenbaum. Is Selectwood ready to take a recommendation on this? Ms. Brewer. I wonder if, um, and I don't you know, put him on the spot, if Mr. Wald perhaps would feel he could respond to this. Although I'm familiar with the, uh, the boring aspects of the local historic district in terms of who signs what when and approves what thing when, um, he's much more familiar with the actual you know, what they can do and what they can't do. And I know we've had a number of brief discussions here at this board about people's interest in developing local historic districts and our um, indicating to them that it's perhaps not the tool they think they're looking for. On the other hand, I think this particular use is exactly the tool that I was looking for the local historic commission, uh, local historic district commission to handle whether it is a house or whether it is a, a, de a development of this nature. So am, am I interpreting that correctly? I mean, this is, this is the kind of tool I was, we'd been talking about local historic districts being able to impact as opposed to development or not development. Right, yeah, if, if I may. I mean, I just should, should preface this by saying since I've known Mr. Greenbaum since I came to Amherst literally from the first day <laughs> and we served in the historical commission, we've been through all this and I understand those concerns and I've been conflicted about this development of this area since 2008. And, but, you know, one makes what one, the best one can out of the situation. I think we've gotten a pretty good situation all things considered. Uh, it's worked out reasonably well so far. So this actually came up at some point last time when we were trying to pass a local historic district on the town meeting listserv. Some people were concerned about those two lots specifically and asked me what could happen. And I gave the answer that I think you're referring to, which is basically that, you know, right now it's zoned for a certain use. So the local historic district is an overlay. It doesn't affect use, it affects appearance. So. Uh, since the zoning was already in place, the owner is entitled to do what he wants to do. Uh, and this is my bottom line, too, that 
under the current, you know, as Mr. Crowner reminded us quite appropriately, we're not voting on ACTV Amherst Media, we're voting about a zoning change. So that's one thing. Number two, again, that's about the use. My concern is mostly about the appearance. You know, does it fit the district? And that's where the local historic district comes in. So while the local historic district cannot say that Mr. Gadera cannot build there because he already has that right, if these were, if this, if this had not been zoned that way, a change in the, in the zoning would, would be involved also with historic district issues. But right now they're going to talk about the appearance of that. And so I guess my bottom line is right now he can put up anything he wants in those two lots under the current residential zoning. Uh, they can be boxy ranch houses or off the shelf two stories, whatever is allowed by the height there. Uh, the proposed rezoning at least holds out that there's no guarantee but under the proposals we saw, and I think what Mr. Greenbaum was referring to was the proposal for the ACTV building, not residential housing, but Mr. Gadera can correct me, I may not recall correctly. Uh, so right now two things can go, two houses can go there no matter what. Uh, right under the change, the likelihood is that one lot will be developed and one left open. In both cases though, the local historic district would be able to have a, a, a say in the appearance of those structures. So I, don't, I guess that's a long way around, but uh, the protections, I think, are extremely valuable. And I would, I would trust the local historic district commission to make the right decision about whatever goes up there either way. So I'm ready to take a position on this. All right, Ms. Steiner would like to make the motion. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting article 36 mm -hmm zoning petition amend official zoning map to change zoning designation on parcels 14b-250 and 14b-251 from rg to bn second all in, uh, for the discussion all in favor say aye 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 all opposed i'm not opposed but i'm going to abstain for the moment abstain. i'd like to look into a little bit more the kinds of businesses that could be built in a local historic district, okay, in terms of architecture. Mr. Wong? Again, the, bus the, you, the business is not affected. It's only the form, so. That's what I'm talking about, the form. There are the, the commis commission, the, 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 the rules are being developed. There's some general rules that are, that are drafted, but you're not going to get a guarantee of 100% about a certain outcome. All right, I'll just leave it as an abstention for now. Okay, Mr. Hayden, did you vote? I did. I voted yes. You voted yes. Okay. So that was four in favor and one abstention. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Very good. All right. Moving right along. Uh, thank you folks for coming in for that. Um, so now we are up to Article 29, the Residential Rental Property Bylaw. And <coughs> we have Mr. Zomak here to talk to us about this. And uh, we also have Article 38, which is the petition, uh, which is similar, uh, the Residential Rental Property Permit called um but that that we'll talk about that one afterwards to see where they differ did you have a comment yeah i just wanted to very briefly uh, uh introduce this and then have dave walk through fairly quickly some of the particulars uh strongly recommending to the select board uh that you support article 29 residential rental property bylaw uh, this is the result of a uh, uh very thorough process i think with uh Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Working Group. I convened uh, a few months back uh, uh, with uh, all kinds of input. Uh, you know, no one can claim any process is perfect, but the fact that they worked the problem exhaustively and the product that came out with a set of recommendations at the end really did uh, evolve over time and uh, I think benefited from the input that was, that was generated. I think it's responsive uh, to the many issues that were raised. Uh, I think it establishes uh, baseline compliance with life, uh, sanitary, uh, life safety and sanitary codes. It increases awareness of the uh, town bylaws on, and health regulations on property exteriors. It, it takes a major step forward on uh, identifying and clarifying parking plans appropriate to each property and there's a number of others but uh, 
It's a complaint-based system, uh, relies on uh, uh, self-inspections primarily, and then our inspector staff is really dealing uh, with complaints that are received. So on that basis, we don't believe the proposal is overly bureaucratic or expensive. There's a relatively modest $100 uh, per property uh, is the estimated fee. That would be the, the bylaw gives the select board the authority to set appropriate fees uh, for the uh, administration of this bylaw. And that was a specific recommendation from the working group about establishing $100 uh, per property, not per unit, uh, uh, to uh, pay for the, the cost of uh, overseeing this. And I think it has the potential to make uh, some positive influence on, on uh, protecting neighborhoods while also allowing our very important rental market to operate but in a more effective way and more in harmony with the surrounding neighborhoods. So I'd turn it over to Dave. Thank you. Wait, I'm, I'm not sure Mr. Musanti left me w much to work <laughs> with, but given the lateness of the hour and the fact that we have been before you um, on a couple of different occasions uh, over the last few months for updates and summaries, I will keep my comments very brief. I think Mr. Musanti covered uh, many of the high points. Uh, this has been a months-long process with uh, extensive public input. Um, I would call your attention to the information in the packet uh, that was provided for you last week and will form the basis for the information going out to town meeting members in the second mailing uh, middle of this week. In that packet, um, just to call your attention to, uh, there was a, a, um, a summary of, of, the, of the bylaw itself and the process that got us to that, uh, making the recommendation to Mr. Musanti. There is a draft FAQ, frequently asked questions that cover a whole host of of different things, uh, including many of the comments and concerns that we, we um, received from the public uh, throughout our process. In it uh, was a, um, um, a draft of the application. Also included was a draft of the self-certification checklist, as well as the uh, required information that will uh, go to tenants. Um, and then there was a, a nice one-page informational chart um, uh, created by a uh, member uh, of the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Working Group, Phil Jackson. And I think those documents together uh, present a pretty clear picture of uh, the recommendation that we, we uh, brought to Mr. Musanti after getting some feedback um, after the working group was done and getting some feedback from town council. The article, Article 29, was tweaked in a few ways to tighten it up uh, and to make sure that um, um, uh, when it uh, is reviewed by the Attorney General, uh, that it is um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the shape that we want it to be in, and that formed the basis of, of the, the text you see in Article 29. So I think I'll stop there. If there are questions, I'm sure that Ms. Ms. O'Keefe, who was on the working group uh, with me, uh, or Mr. Musanti, we'd be happy to answer those questions um, as best we can. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll just point out a couple of other points. One is um, the tenant information sheet and the registration forms, things like that, those are really just illustrative at this point. Those are those will be tweaked, fine-tuned. If, if this passes uh, town meeting, um, th then we have about nine months to kind of take care of details like that. But this was to, to give folks a sense. Um, the other point I wanted to make, oh, I want to make two other points. One is, um, the, the big change from when this was presented to all of us several weeks ago is that um, at the, the meeting the next day, after we uh, had our presentation on Monday night, at the Tuesday night meeting the next day, the working group decided to um, make very clear in its recommendation that behavior was also a component of the permit and could be a consideration for suspension. And that is addressed in the FAQ, but I wanna make sure that it's very clear. It would not be the tenant's behavior per se. The landlord would never be held responsible for the tenant's behavior per se, which would be outside of their actual control. But it, that is the, it is responsive to what the landlord's um, actions to address any behavioral problems would be. So just like 
it the permit concept involves um, uh, it, the I should say the, the suspension concept. So the permit sort of presumes compliance, um, but the suspension part of the permit is for um, incidents of egregious nonconformance or lack of good faith effort towards cooperation or obtaining compliance. We had originally been talking about that just mostly in terms of kind of zoning and health codes, but we added to that behavior issues. So um, if if tenants, for example, were continuously parking um, inappropriately on the property out of accordance with the approved parking plan, uh, the landlord would need to take steps, take some sort of good faith efforts to be dealing with that. If they just threw up their hands and said, hey, I'm sorry, not my problem, that would be that would be a, a lack of good faith effort on the landlord's part. Similarly, if the uh, tenants were to have, say, loud parties at a property, um, if the if those parties uh, if if the landlord took effort to try and address those maybe that would be hiring uh, private security maybe it would be sending you know registered letters talking about how this is absolutely not appropriate maybe it would be arranging meetings with the tenants whatever the good faith efforts would be that that would not have the uh, landlord in any way in danger of having their permit suspended if they were in fact aiding and abetting the problem situation or they were simply ignoring it um, then that would be similar to the uh, to with the building and health code situation they would be they would be uh, not cooperating with the code officials uh, code officials and um, and not making good faith efforts to solve the problem. So we did very specifically affirm that the behavior bylaws, just like the zoning bylaws, are things that the landlords need to be taking positive steps to address. So I wanted to make sure that that was clear, that that was a, a really a pretty significant change from um, from when we talked to you before. Um, and the other thing, just uh, clear, uh, to um, uh, elaborate a little on Mr. Zomek's point about the parking, we originally had said kind of very clear, cut and dried, no parking on dirt or grass. And the attorney general flagged that and said, mm, you really can't do that. That is, uh, that would be a zoning uh, issue for parking. Um, you cannot do with a bylaw something that you ought to be doing through, uh, through a, you cannot do with a general bylaw something that you should be doing through the zoning bylaw. And so the fact is we actually already have covered through the um, change that we made in uh, spring of 2011 about parking design standards, um, we're pretty covered by this. So it's it's possible there's sort of a tiny percentage of properties that will fall through the cracks on this, but, um, but the new design standards for any change in parking requires that it not be on, um, on dirt or grass anyway. So um, anything, if you were to have a change in the parking on the property, then already it would be covered by the zoning bylaw. So, uh, so we think that this captures like 95% of what we were trying to do with our blanket statement, but has the benefit of being able to pass the Attorney General's uh, approval, which otherwise would have been a complete disaster. So those are the big changes. I'll shut up now. Um, questions or comments from Select Board? Ms. Brewer. Well, one of the one of the positive, and we've talked about this obviously several times, so I won't go over all my previous comments. But um, I, I like the fact that you were specific in that there were not a minimum number of parking spaces required, because there certainly are circumstances where, depending on the location, it may make sense that it would be perfectly okay not to have a car per person. So I'm very grateful that we are considering that, because we talk about that sort of thing all the time. But then when we actually go to do things, it sometimes seems like we're still very car focused. So that's great. One of the things I'm a, I have some level of concern about, and I'm not, I, I know that you perhaps all share at the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Working Group what your expectation is, how you plan to express to landlords, because again, we're not talking about 98% you know, of the landlords, we're talking about that weird 2% that's the problem in terms of what a good faith effort is. Now you gave the example of registered letter, I, mean, I know they were just examples, registered letters, private, par um, private security, those seem like really concrete actions. I, I would hate to see us get into a lawsuit over, well, I told them, <laughs> I told them not to do that anymore. That was my effort, that's all I have to do. I'm not their parent, I told them not to do it. So I wonder how do you specify, how can we specify to the landlords what some examples of what good faith means so that it's clear we're holding them to a certain standard associated with that rather than just 
what they might imagine to be good faith because those are the people that we already have a problem with. Thank you. Mr. Zomek. Sure, I can, I can take a stab at this. So the bylaw doesn't get into the, the, the kind of micro uh, of right. those steps, but it does in section 12, 13, and 14 outline a very logical, um, um, graduated, uh, increasingly um, uh, um, uh, clear uh, series of steps that staff would need to take with landlords, whether it be staff from the building department, the health department, the fire department, or in concert, multiple departments with a landlord for various things that might be happening at a particular property. So I think, although we couldn't get into the specifics of you must first phone call, first right. certified letter or letter, certified letter, um, it does leave um, obviously some uh, room for uh, the uh, figure, uh, be it the building commissioner or the health director or the fire chief to use their discretion, but it does lay out a process <coughs> by which those steps would happen, including if uh, an inspection was necessary for X, Y, or Z reasons. Um, and then it, it, it uh, even has the appeal process laid out in the bylaw as well. Uh, if a landlord feels as though uh, they have been not been treated fairly. Um, so that's really the way we dealt with those steps. Uh, in talking with our building commissioner, for instance, there are multiple ways that good faith efforts can be shown. Um, some of them have been reported by Mr. Mora uh, to this, to this uh, board uh, as well as to the town manager uh, in terms of responsiveness about parking. We've had excellent success over the last couple of months uh, with Mr. Mora simply working with landlords on voluntary mm -hmm. measures that they can take. Uh, let's get all those cars on the pavement. Let's create a, a um, short of this bylaw, an informal parking plan that shows uh, or installs uh, stones here or a split rail fence here or some hedge to, uh, to block. So um, again, those, uh, that discretion it will be up to the code uh, uh, enforcement person, uh, but I think there's a way, way to do that that, that uh, is in line with uh, section 12, 13, and 14. Okay. Other questions or comments from select board? Ms. Stein. Is there an online site for the um, building and sanitary code? Because health and safety are, you know, dealt with very tersely referring to that. And I'd be curious to know what kind of um, health issues, for example, um, might I'm sure there is. I, I'd be happy to get that for you. I don't and know it off do the top of my head because it's not no, something I'm I... I'm just curious because health and safety, it says health all the time, but you know, I'd like to be able to know that a landlord or a person who's interested um, could go and check out what the health standards should be. Well, I will say that as part of this effort, and we had extensive conversations about this in the working group, all uh, this, this program, if, if um, supported by town meeting and, 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 and funded, um, will uh, by and large be online. So there will be a website created, there will be applications created that are all uh, essentially fillable forms so landlords, uh, owners can go in, fill out those forms, submit them online, um, see how their application is uh, being processed, where it is in the process uh, of being approved. Um, and then there will also be an online component, of course, with the reference material to links to various codes or other materials that landlords, owners need to, and tenants need to uh, be aware of. And tenants. But then there will also be a way for uh, anyone, the general public, to uh, follow the, if there are enforcement actions, to follow uh, those enforcement actions as they proceed. And again, Mr. Mora, um, Ms. Fetterman have been very uh, upfront with their reports in the last uh, five, six months as we've gotten uh, a better handle on how we're following up on complaints in the field. This will be a complaints-driven system, as Mr. Musanti said. Uh, there will be no vol uh, mandatory inspections. Um, so uh, really, the work will be upfront in the application process, the reviewing of those applications, the reviewing of the parking plan, and then the uh, issuing I, of a permit. Okay. Um, 
I got a call this week from a tenant, very unhappy with the conditions in the facility in which he's living, and I would like to be able to go and see if his complaints are reasonable by comparing them to whatever the standards are. So I, I think other people may also have that issue. Sure. Well, I'd be happy to get you a link to- That's fine. Um, Thank you. To the, you want right. the health. Um, right. Sure. Because we, you know, it's part of the health and safety initiative, so knowing what the health concerns are legitimate sure. uh, would be useful. Happy to get you a link to that health code. And, and they could always meet confidentially with staff in the health department as well if they had questions. Other questions or comments from Select Board? Okay. Um, questions or comments on the article in general? Ms. Barbara? Denise Barber at Precinct 9. This doesn't sound like, this is working, I'm assuming. It is. Doesn't, yes, sorry? It is working. It is, okay, all right. So I have thought a lot about this bylaw, particularly because as a renter, it does affect me. And I think I have finally come to understand what this bylaw is actually about. Um, as I mentioned uh, probably about a month ago, um, residents have been pressuring Town Hall for help in dealing with increasingly disruptive student behavior. And while I don't know a lot about that, I do know that in the first uh, probably can about... You can you speak a little louder? Because the people in the back can hear you, and I'm having trouble. So hold on just one moment. Um, Amherst Media, if you're able to increase the amplification of the uh, speakers in this room, that would be helpful. So they will try and do that, and we can just keep talking because they need us to be talking so that they can hear that happen. So, okay. Ms. Barbara, please continue. But talk as loud as you can because oh. truly the people in the back couldn't hear. They okay. could also move up. <laughs> okay, here we go again. Um, I haven't directly experienced the fun that people in Lincoln Avenue and Fearing Street and Main Street experience, though I can hear Main Street definitely Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and probably in the last four or five years, we have had increasing herds of students um, coming up the street one, two, three, sometimes earlier, sometimes later in the morning. Uh, they usually don't disturb me because I'm usually still awake at those hours, but nonetheless, I'm very much aware of their presence. So this was the impetus for this particular rental bylaw. Um, it interferes with people's quality of life to the point where some people have simply said, this is enough, this is not what we bargained for, and we're moving out of town. And they sell their house and they move out of town, which is very unfortunate. So the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Working Group, and I want to um, mention again that that was a group of homeowners. There were no renters, not even a token renter, not even a student on that group. They came up with a solution in the form of this rental regulation by rental registration bylaw. But to my mind at least, there is a problem. What they were supposed to what you, they were supposed to be solving was the disruptive behavior that people were having to put up with more and more and more in their own neighborhoods. But it appears that the problem you have focused on instead is the condition of rental housing in town, approximately 50% of the dwelling units in town, interior and exterior conditions. Now, I didn't realize that this was a problem. Okay? Now, Diana has brought up at least one problem, but I didn't realize that there was a widespread problem with this in town. And as far as I know, there hasn't really been any documentation presented as this being a widespread problem in town. Yes, there are parking complaints. Apparently, a lot, of the par a lot of the complaints that have come to the building inspector have to do with parking. Some problems with the condition of apartments, but as far as I know, it is not a widespread problem. And that is very unfortunate. So now, with this new bylaw, we're not talking about the 2% of landlords as being weird, did you say? As Ms. Brewer said, we're talking about the combined total of the two weird percent and the 98 no problem percent to make it 
100% of the landlords and tenants and dwelling units in town that will be affected by these rental regulations. There's, and essentially what they will have to do is prove why they are not a problem. So rather than us looking at the problems that are already known, that you can see, that you can hear, and that sometimes you can smell as you're driving or walking by, those are the problems we know. But that doesn't matter. That's not what we're looking at. We're going to look at everybody else, presume that they're a problem, and through paperwork and parking plans and checklists and certifications saying that by God, all your, uh, what was it, the non-porous surfaces are without interruption. We are asking people to prove that they are not the problems and they're going to have to sign and attest that everything is up to code under pains and penalties of perjury. So essentially, this makes those of us who were not included in the voting members of the working group feel like we are bad like the landlords are bad, like they are not keeping up their properties, like the tenants are bad, and they are like children because they don't know what their rights are, and they are not capable of looking after their own health, safety, and welfare. And in the meantime, homeowners who may be in need of having their own health, safety, and welfare looked at just as much as renters and tenants will, will not be subjected to these particular regulations. This is a very unfortunate situation. I know that the working group has worked very hard and they have presented something that purports to deal with a problem, but unfortunately I don't think it does. I think it distracts the town from dealing with a real problem, which is a serious one. How do you control this behavior? <coughs> Nobody's come up with a pretty good solution at this point. And I think people will say, well, they've worked hard, this is better than nothing, but it is not. It is intrusive. It is insulting to people who not only who Could are. Can I interrupt adults, you? Could you tell me what's intrusive about it as a tenant? Having somebody come in and going through and checking and saying this, 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 and this. If you're an adult, you don't want to have your mother or your father come in and basically tell you make sure that your room is clean. This is not something that any homeowner wants to be subjected to. I don't think tenants should be subjected to it just because they're not paying a mortgage. So that's why I find it to be intrusive and also insulting because it says I'm incapable of looking after my own welfare and I am certainly quite capable of doing that. And I think you will find that most of the people who rent in town are. And quite frankly, if the town is looking to attract more high-end renters, if they come and they find out, wait a minute, they're going to come in and inspect my place, they're going to go to Northampton. They're not going to go to Amherst. Thank so, you very much. And then there's the, the final thing I want to comment on is that this is not ready to go. It is not better than nothing. It should be referred back to the committee, and the committee should have a different composition for the second time around to include renters because the fact that there was not a single renter on the committee Yes, you got input, but no renters were voting members of the committee. That is sort of like taxation without representation, and that shouldn't be happening in Amherst. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have to categorically reject Miss Barbarette's um, uh, categorizing this uh, as a needing everyone to prove that they are not a problem. Um, that's not at all what this is. Um, this is a set of... Uh, really, it's a compilation of existing regulations. Um, the idea that uh, that the landlord needs to attest to everyone's dwelling meeting the already defined um, health and safety codes. There's no change in what those codes are. And really, this is a tenant protection. Um, you could quibble on the details of, of how one determines that your your dwelling unit does in fact meet the health and safety codes, but I think that as a community, we all want to make sure that they do. And at this point, they don't. Um, this isn't about 2%. Um, this is about an opportunity to address a whole bunch of issues. While it's true that the behavior issues in um, and the 
the conditions uh, of certain houses is what has brought a lot of this to the forefront. We also have a new inspection staff that is finding horror stories like you can't believe in um, in rental housing. So when we have situations of illegal apartments, illegal bedrooms, um, we have this is a, this is a a system that has been. Um, not had enough attention paid to it uh, up until now. And so this is really an opportunity to try and uh, protect tenant safety, uh, protect uh, neighborhood quality of life, and d determine expectations and clarification on those expectations that's going to raise all properties. I think it's a big mistake to think about this as a punishment to anybody. This is no more a punishment to landlords and tenants than our food truck regulations were a punishment to food trucks, or the taxi regulations are a, are a penalty to taxi companies. This is when, when you reach a certain critical mass of having collective impacts, you need to be able to have, uh, to exert some kind of community control over those if as a community you decide that that is in fact what you wanna do. So we are giving town meeting uh, an opportunity to say, okay, are, are these the kinds of, uh, of controls that we as a community want to have in response to the concerns that have been brought to us? So, um, so I, I just need to reframe that a little bit. To the point of not having any tenants on the committee, um, the, the efforts were made to get students onto the committee and they failed. And I can't speak to why there weren't any non-student renters on there, but the, the fact that there were no student renters was, uh, was very unfortunate for sure, but, um, but that, was not, that was not by design. So, Mr. Zomer. Could I just add also that the committee and many members of the public who were involved in the multiple, multiple meetings we had, including night forums, um, also um, um, gathered information from uh, communities like ours all over the country. So this, uh, the set of bylaws that, um, the bylaw that is being proposed um, to town meeting um, has many of the elements of other university and college towns throughout the country. And so um, it is very much in line with what other communities are, are doing to try to, as you said, um, bring together um, health regulations, other regulations under one, the auspices of one program, in this case one bylaw, and um, apply them fairly and, and raise all boats in town. Um, I, I agree with you 100% that this was not uh, about behavior. This was about um, looking at our housing stock, our rental stock throughout town. And I guess I would challenge anyone to, you know, simply drive around Amherst and take a look. Um, it is, it is not in the best condition. It is not in the condition overall that I think a lot of us would like to see it. So um, some of it is very good, well-kept, well-maintained, but uh, hopefully this program will help raise all of that so that these are better dwelling er uh, units for all tenants. Thank you, and, and just the final point I wanted to make also is that um, Ms. Barbara mentioned that this is applying different standards to renters than to homeowners, and that's just not true. There's, there's, no, there's nothing in here that is specific to renters. Um, every, every home is supposed to meet all of the health and safety requirements, and as it turns over, as you turn over a, a house when it's sold, that's the only opportunity to make sure that they do. Um, the parking situation, if you were to change your parking situation and suddenly you were to need to park a bunch more cars in your home, at your home as uh, an owner occupant, the exact same parking rules would apply to you. The only thing that's different is the uh, you don't need to register your property. That's the only thing that's different. So um, none of the other, no other specifics are are, are at rental properties. Uh, rather than owner-occupied, they apply across the boards. Ms. Stein. I want to make two points. One is that this is a, a complaint-driven process. Um, in the case of uh, where somebody feels there is, um, there are issues with a particular property, um, and the owner has filed the list, the, uh, st the checklist, and signed off on it, and the tenant feels that that's, or a neighbor feels that, that there are things that are wrong and makes a complaint, that's when things move forward. And I'd also like to read a particular portion 
which says an owner shall not be found. This is, um, well, anyway, an owner shall not be found in violation of the cell certification program if they have been refused access for an inspection by a tenant slash occupant. However, in such instances, the owner shall either provide the town with a signed statement from the tenant slash occupant indicating that inspection was refused, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think this vision of people being forced to, to have an inspection without a reason in the first place and even under those circumstances, they could deny it. So I just, uh, that struck me when I read this that, um, that in fact, a uh, tenant would not have to have their property inspected. And there, there's also a, a separate provision for um, long-term tenants having to have that self, uh, That's right. have Once. the landlords attest to the um, status less frequently. So the reality is we live in a community with a ton of students who are renting properties for the very first time. It is a very unsophisticated rental audience, rental um, consumer market that in some cases is being taken terrible advantage of. And so we as a community, because we, uh, we have a vested interest in it as well, but also just because it's right, are trying to take steps to also protect the tenants in this. Ms. Brewer. A couple quick things, um, building on what you just said about being taken advantage of, that was one of the things I was really pleased to see that we covered quite clearly is that um, when, when if something does go egregiously bad, it isn't that the tenants are gonna end up out on the street because that, that's something we wanted to avoid and that was something we've always had some struggles with associated with the four person bylaws that it, it, it's not the tenant's fault that six people live there, it's the landlord's fault in many cases, okay. We can Especially now because if this, if this is to pass, then the landlord is attesting that they understand and have made clear. The tenant is receiving the information saying, guess what, this is the law, this will be enforced. I mean, I, I deal with <laughs> students all the time. Some of them have no idea no that idea. this is a bylaw exactly. in Amherst. And so. And they'd have no reason to know any, you know, even if they were to be really, you know, want to comb through things. It's just not something that would occur. Plus they see it happening out in the community. So therefore they wouldn't be concerned about it. I also, and and again, the, the, the inspections are not proactive, so to speak. I mean, yes, the landlord's attesting to the condition of the property, but it's not like they're coming in and bugging you to do inspections. So um, it, it's a very different feeling. And I also, it, it's probably not worth trying to clarify, who knows what'll show up in the newspaper anyway, but the 2% the weird thing I, that was referenced that I apparently said is associated with the fact specifically of peop, land, the very small percentage of landlords who seem unclear on the concept associated with good faith efforts associated with behavior. So it's a very small drill down percentage of people that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about because I, I know the, the theory's been thrown around, well, just because of a few bad apples, they're making everyone suffer. And I think for all the reasons that you very clearly elaborated, Mr. Zonix elaborated, and the conversations we've had all this time have elaborated on, that's not what we're attempting to do. We're not attempting to put in some big bad system to deal with three really irritating people, really irritating, weird, whatever we wanna call them. It's that we're doing a proactive thing. Given that we know that there are some people who really don't get it, I was just trying to see what teeth we have to make sure that we feel like we have the discretion to be able to say to them, yes, that means you really have to do something. So I was satisfied by that. And, and at the end of the day, this is not going to solve every problem. No. It's not going to um, create every protection to every tenant, to uh, every neighborhood. This is this is going to do the best it can to establish kind of a new a new norm and and very clear expectations. All right, uh, select board need more information before it takes rec um, takes position. Okay, you, you want to speak? So does select board need more comment on this from folks objecting to it? Mr. Grosskop, you've been here patiently, so we'll let you speak anyway. Uh, Please introduce yourself. Ben, ben Grosscup, uh, town meeting member in Precinct 9, and just had a question about uh, Ms. Stein read Section C of uh, uh, the Section 7 uh, about the um, 
how, how it would be okay for a, uh, a tenant to refuse access mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. the, but, to, to the landlord, but I just was reading section D about the lease terms actually requiring that access be granted, like that be part of the lease that you sign, that you would actually have to grant access to, to the landlord. So I was just wondering, doesn't you that, reconcile those? Doesn't that section sort of contradict the section that you read from? So if I might answer that. I'm still that, getting a handle it, on this. It doesn't. I will defer to the people <laughs> who worked on the Safe and Healthy Committee. The fact I is we live in a state with great tenant protections. And so we started off with a wish list of things that we would regulate here that all just kind of disappeared because <laughs> you simply can't do that in this state. Um, so no matter what your lease says, you as a tenant can deny access to your landlord. You can. They might not renew your lease or something like that, but um, but a, a landlord can't enter without your permission, no matter what the word. So C says. overrides D in this case. The the we can't do anything locally that overrides state law. Mm -hmm. Is the bottom line. So your your lease can say whatever it wants to say, um, and that also that's that's just an agreement between you and the property owner. You are still protected as a tenant by state law. Mm -hmm. So, but, but, but a tenant is presumably going to know more about the lease that they signed than they're going to know about state law. So it is, you don't have to sign a lease that says that you are agreeing to provide access if you don't want to. But having signed that lease, it's an, it's, it's an understanding between the tenant and the landlord. And so to qualify for a tenant, uh, for a permit as a landlord in Amherst, your lease would have to say that if you use leases, if you don't use leases, la not all landlords use leases, um, then they have to make clear in some kind of a letter that good faith effort is made to, to, um, to allow access as, as practical or whatever, I can't remember what it says, but as the, as the tenant, you always have the right to um, oppose that, prohibit that. Y it's your house, it's, your, it's where you live, you don't have to let anybody in that you don't want to. Thanks. Thank you. All right, other public comment? All right, so actually before we take a position on this, I think it's important to get the, um, get the sense of the petition article because I don't want us to have taken a position on one precluding the other. So um, if the petitioners could come forward and, and give us a, um, an idea of how your article is different from this and what the status of it is now. This is the, the uh, overview that will be going out to right here. They'll be going out with a second. <coughs> Okay, sure, pages. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Maureen Adams, for pr uh, town meeting rep from uh, Precinct 10. I guess I should put my teacher voice on, right, to try to get the folks behind me. They will be waving to you if they can't hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, Steve Bloom is the person who submitted this on behalf of the Coalition of Amherst Neighborhoods. Uh, Mr. Bloom is unable to be here tonight. He sends his regrets. And since I'm part of the et al., I thought I would come along and represent our uh, position. Uh, as you know, as a citizen petition, we had to get this in by March 11th. Uh, while <coughs> the uh, Shinwig, as we call it, the working group, was still working hard. So we uh, presented a petition that represented much of what is in the work, is in Article 29, much of what we agree with, although there are some differences that I will go through with you in just a moment. Uh, basically, uh, we strongly endorse Article 29. And so what remains of 38 will really depend on what happens with 29 in some part, except for the places where we disagree, and then I think we'll need to make a decision about how to go forward with 39. 38, 29, 38, thank you. I have to get the numbers correct. Uh, so let me just say before I uh, kind of go through this sheet uh, that uh, in, in a similar discussion with the Finance Committee, uh, we, the Finance Committee concluded that they weren't really certain what there would be of Article 38 
in the uh, aftermath of decisions about Article 29. So in that case, we have agreed to have a meeting prior to the discussion of 38, but after the discussion of 29. And so that seems to me one reasonable way to avoid the kind of extensive discussions of ifs and thens, which is very hard to evaluate at this point. So what I try to point out, uh, what we try to point out in this one page overview to go with the mailings, is that we agree with the working group that a rental permit requirement for landlords is one of many tools, not the only tool, to, dis to deal with the kinds of problems that we've all been talking about, this Miss Barbarette was talking about, et cetera. In other words, we're not talking about hordes of students on the streets. We're talking about conditions created by the commercial use and in some cases abuse of rental property that, have dis that are destructive of the quality of life within a neighborhood. So we agree with that very specific focus of the working group and we will be saving clearly the other problems for another day. Uh, so that we agree with the idea behind a rental permit. This is something that we wanted so much that we put in the petition to be sure there'd be something on the town meeting agenda pending the decisions about 29. Uh, we, in an effort to create the least onerous permit system possible, and I think that both the working group and our position is what you might call rental permit light. It's nowhere nearly as demanding as other permit systems are in other municipalities and other college towns. So that we agree not to have mandatory inspections as most other jurisdictions require, but instead only that inspections be complaint driven uh, so that they, rather than being punitive, they encourage compliance when violations are found. So I've outlined the basic areas of agreement that we have with the working group. Now there are several striking differences. One is that because we were so concerned about the commercial use of student rentals, we did not include all owner-occupied rental units. And that's a very important distinction between the two proposals. So rather than including all owner-occupied as well as non-owner-occupied rental units, our rental permits cover non-owner-occupied, what we see as essentially commercial rental units. Uh, I think that our reasoning was that we wanted to start incrementally, and so rather than affecting the entirety of the rental stock, we thought that we would take a more incremental approach. I think that there are political dimensions to this as well that I won't go into, but I'm just emphasizing the substantive reason why we made that decision. Our research had shown that all the nuisance houses were non-owner occupied, we had found that owner-occupied one or two rentals were not nuisance houses. Our concerns were about the regulation of nuisance houses, and that's why we went in that direction. The second difference has to do with the fees. Uh, we had felt that there was greater parity and fairness in charging by the unit than by the address. In other words, we felt that there was a basic unfairness in someone by the working group's uh, approach, having two rental units paying essentially the same fee as someone who had 200 units. Uh, we know that there are reasons, there are arguments on one side or the other. This is not something that we will live or die on, but it is a difference between the two proposals. And finally, unlike Article 29, we do not take up parking. We felt that parking was a very complicated issue we felt that it involved uh, non-rental households as well as rental units and commercial rentals, and we felt that we would look forward to another day when the town's parking problems would be addressed by a separate town zoning bylaw. So those are the three major differences. And are you planning to amend, move to amend anything in 29? Yes. Uh, 
my best understanding, and uh, I can only talk about my own plan. I don't under I don't know what everyone will do who is in town meeting. Uh, I have no plan to try to amend 29. I think we've had a number of discussions with with you, with the town manager, with others. Uh, there was an interesting discussion at the Finance Committee about some of the political dimensions of issues on which we differ, namely whether one does an overall approach to all rental units in town in order to get hold of the rental stock, or whether one approaches the non-owner occupied essentially commercial rentals and starts there. There are political dimensions as well as other dimensions. Uh, and uh, our understanding was that those of you on the working group would have your own amendments on the ready if you felt that was appropriate in, re in response to the discussion at town meeting. Uh, our purpose is to ha uh, that uh, our purpose is to have something as a backstop to the working group, and something that is more modest in scope and cuts out some of what we consider to be the more contentious issues. Because what we want is not that one article or another article succeed or fail. What we want is a rental permit. And uh, that that is the reason for our having the backstop to Article 29. Okay, so so it's a backstop. It's not an alternative because you're saying that you're, you're you yourself are not looking to move amendments to twenty nine, and you would not be looking to oppose twenty nine and support thirty eight instead. That that's not my intention, and I believe that that's not the intention of many people who are the et alls within the coalition. Okay, all right. But so I I can't speak for what people might do on their uh, for their sure yes. for sure. Okay, so select board so. So how would you like to deal with this? Do you want to deal with the pros and cons of the elements that are different here, or do you just want to say, like the Finance Committee, we could leave this to a future discussion if 29 fails? Um, so process, Ms. Brewer. I'd like to touch on the difference in the owner-occupied or not, because I know that was a, a conversation that we had here briefly, and I know that you had lots of conversations about, and that's a component that's very important to me personally that I in, in supporting the whole process so while I understand the philosophy behind doing it one way I also appreciate that a lot of this was purely making sure there was space on the agenda so to speak on the warrant to make sure something happened so if everything went kerflui with safe and healthy neighborhoods there'd be something happening over here so I appreciate that it doesn't appear to be attempting to replace but I think it's worth having a brief conversation associated with the owner occupant Okay. Do you want to ask questions about it, or you want you're looking for a comment on the safe and healthy side? I, I guess I'm looking again for the reiteration on the safe and healthy neighborhood side. I mean, I think it is a basic philosophical difference, as I've understood how this has unfolded. Because you know, are we looking at our entire rental stack, or are we focusing on what we presume to be based on some gathering of data to be non-owner occupied? One of the things that I think is, is a big flaw in the owner occupied and what I was concerned about when that was seemed to, to possibly be the way Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods was going is that we know that there are people who will say they occupy a rental that don't, but it's really hard to prove that they're liars. So <laughs> um, if you don't have to have that conversation, then you solve a whole level of problems because that's a person that's more likely to be a problem landlord in the first place. So um, if you had anything to add to that beyond what I remember of this. So I, I would just emphasize that point a little bit more. So not only is it, is it creating kind of an incentive to pretend that you're an owner-occupied thing, that's not just, that's not just a, a, a difference in your, your how much paperwork you fill out. That creates a whole big problem-solving process for the building commissioner. So it takes a great deal of time to try and establish whether or not somebody does live there in, I, and if you're going to now be applying different standards to that. So, um, so that seems like an, uh, something we would not want to encourage at all. Um, furthermore, um, the, we originally had had an owner-occupied exclusion when we had mandatory inspections because we decided really uh, people who own or occupy their houses are probably not stripping out the smoke detectors and blocking up their egresses and whatever. Um, and so that, that seemed 
onerous to be to be requiring of, of folks who who rent out rooms in their house or whatever. Once we took away the mandatory uh, inspection part of it, we realized that actually we've left we're left with something that's that, that's not onerous at all. So even under Article 39, you would still be looking to have them register. The only thing you would not be having them do is fill out the self-certification that their places are safe. Um, and then they would also not have the, the permit attached to that. Um, but the attesting that their units are safe is important, not just for the town, but for the tenant. So for that permit to go online so that the tenant can look and see and say, wait a minute, I'm we, I don't have any smoke detectors down here or whatever, um, or in the case of illegal apartments in somebody's house, that person wouldn't even, they wouldn't even, you know, uh, admit to that I if that was the situation. But now it would be much easier for a neighbor to say, actually, see, they've got a, they clearly have, <laughs> you know, there are a couple of cars here, there's clearly other people living there. If the owner did not get a permit for that and identify um, that, uh, that dwelling unit, then, uh, there's there's just no reason, since there's not a high hurdle, there's no reason to lower the hurdle at all for the owner occupied, um, because it really it's the tenant that's put at risk. Furthermore, we did hear very compelling, I, or I personally found compelling, um, uh, comment f uh, during a public forum that there is no difference whatsoever in the eyes of the law between an owner occupied rental unit and one that's not. So I if you're having the the as the owner as the landlord or if you're having the biggest possible tenant headaches with your with your tenant it doesn't matter if they live in your same house or if they live in that house down the street that you own your your situation is exactly the same under the eyes of the law so it didn't seem um, reasonable to make any kind of a distinction in our regulations mr zolmek did i miss anything important I thought that was very complete i did if, if we wanted to jump to fees for yeah. just a second because that was that is another clear difference. Very, very briefly, um, through staff input and 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 a, and, a, and a thorough discussion among the working group, really we came to this the 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 uh, conclusion that we did about fees, and ultimately the select board will set the fees. But the reason that we I think uh, um, um, ended up at a one fee per property is really uh, Mr. Mora made this case a number of times that. Again, we took out the inspections. This is really um, about the application process. Uh, each owner of a property will apply once, whether they have one unit or 450. And so we're really, it's really all about the cost of and the staff time to review that application, that parking plan. Um, it, it doesn't really um, need to cover the cost of what comes after that, so to speak? So it's it really is a is a fairness issue, and and what what is the cost to the town of reviewing each and every application, and the materials that come with it? So whether you own one unit here or a, a, a smaller four unit complex over here, it's one application, and you'll say I have five units, and I I attest to the same things in unit one, two, three, and four. add a few points on, on another point of view. Uh, as you remember, our, our basic point is we want a rental permit that will pass town meeting. And so I'd just like to make a few points in that connection. One is we're very aware of people who are deceptive in their claims of owner occupancy. We know perfectly well that they don't live there. We know where they live. We know where their tax records are. We know where they vote. The difficulty was that the zoning bylaws did not allow the kind of access to go in to prove what we already knew as neighbors. So I don't think that the argument that it is particularly onerous to figure out whether something is owner-occupied or not, I, I don't think that, that argument has merit because it's actually quite easy to find that out. What is more difficult is having the access to enforce it when the landlord is claiming to, to live there uh, in order to crowd more students in. So I, I, I just wanted to make that point. I, I think that that's not a, okay. A, a second uh, issue, 
has to do with our wanting to focus on the non-owner occupied for two reasons. One is because those are the nuisance houses, and that's what our group wants to control. The second issue I have to say is political. Town meeting, I believe, is peopled with folks who have owner-occupied rentals. And I was very struck at the fall town meeting how people were saying, you can't tell me what I can do with my house. And I can just hear a reprise of that argument in uh, town meeting scuttling this part of the permit. So I have a political argument <coughs> there. When it goes to fees, I've noticed, even though Mr. Mora has a very convincing point about the paperwork, that people's basic sense of fairness and profits from their rentals are offended by the disparity of uh, the amount of fees they have to pay in relationship to the number of units that they are, um, that they are renting. And so again, I see that as a political issue of fairness as an argument in town meeting as well as a substantive issue. So uh, these, these really, a lot of this in our thinking was strategic to make sure that a rental permit passes. Okay, let's not get bogged down in the fees yeah, since it's 10 o'clock. Ultimately, the fees will be exactly. That's not that won't be set by the bylaw. So the select board, if the bylaw passes, the select board would be charged with setting fees. The recommendation from the building commissioner, endorsed by the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Group, is that it would be $100 and that it would apply equally to all properties. But um, if this passes, we can argue about that um, for months uh, <laughs> to get that set. Um, so, so let's not talk about that part anymore, Ms. Brewer. I'm not talking about the amount. I'm talking about the permits themselves. I want to just make sure everybody's clear on if one landlord owns five separate single family houses all over town, they're getting five permits. If one landlord has 200 units on one property, he's getting one permit. But that makes sense, even though on, on the face of it, it seems like, oh, that poor person who has five single family homes, oh, that's so cruel that they have to do five separate permits. But they're five very different units versus 200 units that are basically all the same. And if the, if the permit holder for the 200 units um, had a unit that was egregiously out of compliance and they were being egregiously um, non-cooperative with, they would only lose the ability to rent that unit. They wouldn't have the permit taken away for 200 units. So right. it, it does scale that way. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so uh, the owner-occupied thing, there are a lot of different political arguments you could make and counter-make on that. So I, th I think that we should just leave it with what's the will of town meeting. It will either be amended down at town meeting to, to take owner-occupied out of it or it will stay there, and so we'll see. Um, we already talked about fees, parking, so obviously it's better if we could get a parking component to this than if we can't, but if you're saying that if there's people don't like the parking component then we're still left with something um uh let's see is there anything else then to talk about with this bylaw mr wall i have another comment from that miss taub wanted to speak or any hand right oh. okay um all right uh so though it was just one other point i wanted to make about the owner occupied thing which was um I, I spoke before about unsophisticated tenants and um one something else that i found compelling at the safe and healthy group was the idea that um owner Owners who are looking to rent out rooms in their houses are actually kind of often among the least sophisticated of renters. So, like, suddenly, if I were going to start renting out rooms in my house, I wouldn't have any idea this uh, what the rules were like I would if I were investing in a property, you know, it might be expected to have more plans. Um, so some of the um, property managers said that that requiring them to self-certify, which is really the only difference between whether it applies to owner occupies or not, to, to certify as to the safety standards that their um, rental unit is also meeting is a way of educating those uh, landlords as well, so that that is helping to bring them into compliance and protecting their tenants. So uh, I, it all seemed very reasonable. Okay, so basically everybody, everybody who's not supporting the rental regulation has left. Is that true? <laughs> 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 so is there anything else to argue so about now? <laughs> okay, so I think we're ready to take a position on 29, and we'll talk okay. about how we deal with 38. Ha I'm okay. 
I move to recommend to the May 6, 2013 Annual Town Meeting Article 29, Residential Rental Property Bylaw. Second. For the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. And what do we do? Abstain on 38? 38. And then decide based on what happens at town meeting. I don't know. Ms. Brewer. Well, I mean, it seems like one of the obvious solutions would be to say that um, we, it, it's going to be, uh, chances only seems to be logical, although logic in town meeting, but you know. We're at 10 that, <laughs> that if 29 passes, that there would be no need to have 38. So the petitioner would ask to have it be dismissed because obviously there would be a residential which may or may not have been amended on the floor. So it's moot if it gets dismissed. And if, and if 29 fails, we could, we could have a, a backup vote, a backup plan for uh, 20, you know, assuming that 38 gets moved, whether or not we recommend it. Right, so, um, so I, I think I like what you're saying. So if 29 passes, it doesn't make any difference. If, if 29 doesn't pass, then we will have learned a lot from why 29 didn't pass. And at that point, we'll, we're gonna wanna have more of a discussion, like these, these elements might be the relevant points, there might be different. Might be something <laughs> completely maybe different. We have to sort of amend and strike and start again or whatever. So, um, so uh, let's just defer a position on 38 and only take a that position if it fair. becomes necessary if 29 fails. Okay. Does so that we seem vote to defer? Yes. Sure. Okay. I move to recommend that the select board defer taking a position on CAN residential rental, um, which is Article 38. Sorry, I did that out of order. Do you want me to repeat it? I move that uh, for the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 38 petition CAN residential rental, um, the select board defers um, making taking a position at this time. Second. For the discussion, Mr. Hayden. Do we want to be a little more definitive about when, when the the time would be that we would take a position? No, I don't think so. Because who knows? If 29 <laughs> fails. Right. We've got a lot of space between 29 and 38, <laughs> unless we move very fast. Uh, just, just, just as long as we agree on that, I guess. That's fine. Right. Well, I think actually we should be clear on what is our message to town meeting. So they're going to. I don't know if they're going to know it. Yeah, they're taking a position be clear on what our town meeting is that we're not choosing between them. It's I, I think that I think the key point that needs to be included is if 29 fails. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right, because it isn't the circumstance under which we might find ourselves in another situation where we say no matter what happens, we don't want 38 to pass. No, we're not we're saying we're not that at saying all. That. But that's why so that's I think why you just defer taking a position. But we then don't want to say if 29 fails. It's that's. I don't want anybody to have the mis uh, the uh, misconception that we're considering it potentially an alternative to 29. So we're supporting 29, right. and 38 really is only it, it's only viable if 29 fails. Okay, so how do you so want to right, say so this? That Defers case, taking a position really until town meeting and only if 29 fails? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we could say we will, we will um, consider, it's way too late for me. <laughs> winging this. We could just say no. We could just vote no. And then yeah, change our minds if 29. Well, that's fails. why I said we no, just no, abstain. Right. <laughs> that, that, you can't abstain. It's a recommend. It's a not recommend. Right. It's a defer. All right. So what's um, wrong with leaving it the way I said? To um, that the select board defers taking a position on the May 6th annual town meeting Article 38 petition can resident rental. Um, until town meeting and o it only if article 29 fails. It's fine. Exactly. I think that gets yeah, our sense. That's, that's Ms. Adams. Yeah, that's clear. Excuse me, I, I was going to suggest that you don't even say anything about 38 until you get there. Mm. But I mean, I mean, I, the I only possibility would be 
if we were asked to comment on 29 as a petitioners for 38, and we would speak in support of so 29. It's but the select board itself, you are not making a statement about 38 until we count up to 38. Uh, unless correct? we get into the fact that these are parallel articles, so it yes. will come up in conversation. So we don't want, it, w under the consideration of 29, people are going to say, well, what's going on with 38? The moderator may yes. approve considering them together or whatever. There's going to need to be some distinction made. So yes. the select board's position on you 38 are, in You are supporting 29, ours. and you understand that the coalition has presented 38 as a backup to 29. Uh, it's, it's all right. Yes. It really is okay the way it is it's because we supported 29 5 to 0. And this is saying exactly where we stand. You know, we're not against 38, but we'll take a position if 29 fails. Right, because we don't want to go into 38. If 29 failed, we don't want to go into 38 with a position of opposition to 38. Right. But we also don't right. want to go into it supporting it because it's not that we're supporting it, we're supporting 29. So we're different. Okay, we're, we're good. We're, we're good. trying we're to trying meet trying a number of here. needs. We're trying to put it in a box because there's a little box we have to fill out here. <laughs> and we're also trying to put it on a script. <laughs> and we're also trying to be able to in all be mess. clear if we show up at a precinct meeting. <laughs> and right. somebody asks us at a precinct meeting, right. which yeah. isn't at town meeting, but yet will influence right. people so at town meeting. Right, we want to make sure we're all on the same page yeah. anyway. Mr. Hayden. It's way too late to even <laughs> think about <laughs> asking this question, much less try to get it answered. But um, <clears throat> so, so I'm only going to ask it, so it gets into the minutes. Um, <laughs> what are we gonna do about, um, what could we possibly do about amendments that we, that might get offered to 29? Yeah, but that, that, that's exactly. why I want to stop there. But, Not yeah. now. but that, that is going to, I just. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's going to involve a lot of so. difficulty. Too much, too much for tonight. Too much for now. Yeah, I don't know what we'll do with that one. It's to be determined. Okay. Um, what happened? We've got I've a motion. Seconded. It's been I've seconded. seconded. We've discussed motion. it. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, no, um, I think we are. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going. No, I think we are. We are. Yeah. Yeah. We are. <laughs> okay. Hey, first thing. By God, I spent so thing. much time on this thing. We're you know, we've, we've got. Exactly. All right, let's let's keep control here. So we have a lot of things to do next week, also, or else we exactly. defer. I mean, if we That's thought we problem. weren't going to be here until this we time can't next just week, not then we would it. change yeah. something. All right. So, <laughs> so where are we at? We're not going to be here until oh, next week. So goodness. let's um, assign speakers to these. So we already have Miss Brewer on 15. Mr. Hayden is going to finish up 16. The zoning ones are. Um, first, let's choose the ones that, so converted dwellings is just kind of a technicality. Mr. Hayden, as a planning person, you want to do converted dwellings number 30? Yes. And Mr. Wild, um, because you were our village center zoning person, would you like to speak to um, kind of the other ones? Yeah, I've got a definition. <laughs> <I've got a definition. laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> number 33 is different. That's the building commissioner's thing about non-conformance. Yeah, that's the two we're happy doing. Are you happy you don't yeah, mind doing that? Okay, so then we'll that's change that's seats great. that night. Yeah. Move <laughs> <to the laughs> center. Yeah. Okay, so then Mr. Wild is going to take 31 through 35. Do you mind doing 36? Yeah. Okay, are I folks know. happy with Ms. Wild doing 36? Yeah. Okay, groovy. Uh, that's Mr. Wild, and uh, so I, if you don't mind, I'm going to do 29, uh, unless anyone wants to. No, we're going to wrestle you that. for it. <laughs> that would make so much sense at this point. Uh, yes. So 38, I'll just sort of wing 38. Also, however, that needs to be dealt with. Right. Okay, good. We're done with that. All right, town manager's report. Thank you. <laughs> uh, very quickly. <laughs> uh, state budget update, two things. Uh, the House of Representatives in Boston began deliberation today on the House proposal on the state budget, including several hundred amendments, which is actually normal. <laughs> uh, and in their own legislative way, they are dispensing with those amendments throughout this week. And we think by the end of the week, they'll have an adopted budget. We'll then go to the Senate, and the Senate will do their thing during the month of May reconcile in June, get it to the governor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's happening. And there's uh, good information on the uh, Mass Municipal Association uh, website. 
in terms of updates about what the some of the particulars are on potential amendments and which ones uh, cities and towns are uh, supporting, et cetera. So I encourage you to read up on that. Uh, the second thing, legislatively, the transportation finance bill. Uh, different versions have been passed by the House and Senate, both very different from the governor's in terms of scope, uh, but we believe uh, uh, similar and uh, positive related to support for regional transit, including uh, the PBTA and for dedicating serious money to begin to address local road repair needs, uh, in particular $300 million a year for local so-called Chapter 90 work, which is our local, local streets. Uh, so that bill is now, uh, there have been conferees named by both House and Senate. Uh, they will begin to meet, and we expect that to be conferenced out with uh, a bill that it's quite possible to be closer to the Senate version when all is said and done, which we think would be a very positive outcome. Uh, so that's state budget. Um, safe and Healthy Neighborhoods uh, Initiative in the uh, online packet are the latest in a series of uh, uh, code enforcement related reports from health building and uh, 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 excuse me, health building and uh, yeah, health and building, uh, including, you know, kind of outcome focused. And so you get a sense, uh, looking over the last uh, 12 month period, uh, the number of, of complaints filed and the status and vast majority of which are in the resolved category. And so that's good reading. It's by property address, the nature of the complaint, who responded and what the current status is of those. So uh, that's an ongoing work in progress. They're all posted online on our Safe and Healthy uh, Neighborhoods uh, 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 web page on the town website, and uh, they're on tonight's meeting packet online. Encourage people to uh, uh, inquire and learn about particular properties being addressed one by one. Uh, let's see. Uh, staff recognitions. I wanted to mention uh, we had a number of uh, public safety staff who were called to duty in their uh, mutual aid and other roles uh, related to the marathon bombing, you know, in, in the greater Boston area. Uh, we had uh, two police officers who were uh, activated. Uh, Detective Janet Lopez is in the 747th Military Police Unit. And Officer uh, Johan Madrano's unit was put on standby, but he did not have to respond. But Janet was down in the Boston area uh, for a few days in the immediate aftermath of the uh, bombing on the day of the marathon. We also had three firefighters, uh, Tom Messer, Bill Messer, and Reed Fraley, uh, who were called into service uh, uh, the Messer brothers were both on security uh, details, securing the perimeter of the 14 block area in the immediate uh, area of the, of the bomb uh, site of the explosions, m having that be a secure site for the, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, investigations that were going on, forensic and otherwise. Uh, and Reed Fraley was also... Uh, uh, in service on a security detail. So I want to recognize all five of them. Um, so while that event happened in, in Boston, Watertown, et cetera, we, there were lo law enforcement and other public safety resources called upon state, local, and federal, and our, our folks were, p were part of that. I want to commend them, commend them for their service on that. Um, a couple other things, recent and upcoming activity. Uh, UMass is having another springtime emergency alert system test. Uh, we've been noticed on that. It's happening this Wednesday morning. Uh, that will include sirens and other, uh, you know, text messaging. It's a test of their notification system. So when you hear those sirens go off, that has caused some alarm, uh, anxiety in the past. It's part of a test. 
and just well, we're trying to get the word out, and this is another way to get the word out. Uh, that's happening this Wednesday, the 24th, um, on the uh, uh, 27th is our fourth annual sustainability festival on the town common, 10 to 4. There's a whole uh, news blast on the website. Bring the family, come on down, learn about tree pruning, uh, other sustainability initiatives. It's a growing event. We encourage people to come and participate. Uh, let's see. Uh, last week I had the opportunity to meet again with Chancellor Subhaswamy. We had a really good, good discussion, frank discussion on, on many of the issues uh, uh, we're working on together. Very positive discussion. Uh, and that's, that's ongoing. And the university uh, is really renewing its effort to be a really positive partner. Uh, with the town, uh, and there's a number of initiatives. We've had an, some tremendous outreach on the part of students in particular, uh, any number of events. I think there's a there's a uh, award ceremony and reception happening tomorrow night with student government inviting a bunch of us. I know a bunch of us are going to that. Uh, there's this online undergraduate uh, 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 training that's being built into the uh, residential life piece about uh, what it's like to be a, a young new tenant for the first time and what your rights and responsibilities are as a tenant living in a rental property within a larger community. So I want to applaud the university on that and help try to do what we can to help, help them have that be a success. Also we have the uh, uh, Founders Week activities going on all week at the university including the inauguration of our new chancellor. Uh, this coming Saturday morning at 11 at the Mullins Center, and uh, looking forward to that. Uh, also had the opportunity to meet with a group of Pakistani local government officials uh, who are in Massachusetts uh, with an institute for training and development uh, uh, overseeing this program, uh, and they were giving exposure to how we do things. Uh, so we had a great discussion with them, with some staff about uh, local government and local government democracy, New England style and Amherst style. It was a good, uh, it was a good meeting that we had. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Questions or comments for Mr. Masanti? Um, I'll just note a couple of things. Um, thank you very much for announcing our public safety uh, representative's involvement in the Boston situation. I think that Amherst can be incredibly proud knowing mm -hmm. that uh, our folks were there as part of that extraordinary effort. Um, so uh, thank you to them. Um, the UMass alert, I appreciate your um, announcing that. I think it's really important for us to be spreading the word on this like more so than ever. Um, I think people by and large are kind of used to the fact that, oh, that happens. They hear it. Sometimes it's people are hearing it for the first time and think it's weird. But now people are going to be hearing yeah. it very differently. Um, and people are <laughs> may well be concerned that that is actually a, an incident as opposed to a test. So mm -hmm. the degree to which we can spread the word about the fact that it, that is only a test on Wednesday by UMass's system I think is very important. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. All right. Uh, where are we? Member reports, liaison representative reports. Need to know basis. Ms. Brewer. <laughs> Two <laughs> seconds. So you mentioned the sustainability festival. One part of that is the whole gardening yeah. 350 initiative. There was a meeting in this room, our room. You know, you know this is our room, right? It's a gardening meeting. Wall to wall people. So that was pretty impressive Thursday night. And then the other thing was I went to Craig's Doors um, open house on Saturday. They had even more food. They had a ridiculous spread of food on Saturday. But two of the interesting things that came out of that beyond just the great opportunity to talk to board members and hear from some people there um, is that they felt, I said, well, you know, what's the big difference between last year and this year with the increased capacity? And they said they felt like they were turning fewer people away, which is obviously a good thing. Um, at least one person stated that they thought that that was probably, you know, kind of a good number in terms of j future planning for a different site. Also, um, that they are still continuing to work with various other agencies and successfully transitioning a number of people into transition. 
transitional housing so that there are people who actually you know, have sufficient income that with some support services, as we've been talking about for a long time, have actually been moved into half of a house. So that's also very exciting. So in addition to you know, finding individual placements, there's also this kind of cocoon effort in the, in the intermediate space. So lots of different things going on. And the amazing eight-foot cow is going to be down by the um, installed perhaps the end of the summer. <laughs> Mr. Wald has told us about this. This yes. is a fundraising thing for, that's going to be a sculpture oh, outside of charity shops. The cow. Raising money Instead and of awareness the frog. for homeless. I'd forgotten. And I'm sorry, I'd and forgotten the cow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I can report. Sure. All right. I attended the Shade Tree public hearing about saving the 113 year old oak tree and the Bottom line is the unitar The vote was to try to save it, and the Unitarian Church is going to do its best to help out on that. Um, went to a personnel board meeting on Wednesday. Um, they discussed the non-union employee meeting that had been held. Um, it's important that the job descriptions be complete, um, but the data from that are critical. Um, some departments do annual performance evaluations like DPW, some don't. It be w might be worth doing. So there be one member felt that there should be a paper trail of successes and weaknesses. Um, they thought it would be good if staff successes, um, as you mentioned tonight, be put on the website because a lot of people don't listen to us hard to believe but <laughs> that's a fact <laughs> and it would be nice if you know the staff accomplishments for this week were listed and then it was kind of kept up so people could even go back and look in a previous week and I think making appreciating our our staff and showing that so in a way that more people know about it would be good and that came up um, there's a revised um, sexual and other unlawful harassment policy, which is now included in the personnel manual. Went to the Board of Health meeting that night, and there's um, a lot of effort underway about the medical marijuana being established, and there's going to be... Um, Probably we will try to get a uh, medical marijuana dispensary in Amherst, which is, um, there's, uh, if you wanna know uh, more information about that, um, you can Google frequently asked questions about the medical marijuana um, policies in Massachusetts, I did, and it's very helpful. And the other is, and, and um, Julie Fetterman, our health director, felt that the state was handling this issue very well. She was very reassured about what she was hearing, and there was going to be hearing the next day at Northampton. Um, the other thing that they're working on is tobacco regulation modifications, particularly about minor smoking and they are trying to have the policies be, um, the Tobacco Coalition would like the policies to be the same from one community to the next, so they're gonna be working on that, and there will be a public hearing June 19th um, at 7.05 p.m. on the tobacco regulation modification. And um, I also attended the Craig's door reception, which was great, and I just made two quick announcements. One is on May 18th, um, the at the Survival Center, there will be uh, a say goodbye to Cheryl Zoll, who has been so wonderful. Um, so it's come and have a bagel from 10 a.m. to noon. And the other is that this uh, fraternity that a lot of us had supper with, dinner with, uh, Pi Kappa Phi is having, this is the first annual disability week that they're sponsoring, but they've been active in disability all along, and they're having a bike-a-thon, a 36-hour a bike-a-thon, and I think they've done that maybe 38 times before, 
um, as part of Push America, but this is to earn money for disability projects. Thank you. I'm done. Um, yeah, so that's a stationary bikeathon. So they just right. so they Space. they raise awareness <laughs> by all being on campus, right. um, taking turns on these stationary bikes, bicycling in place for 36 that hours, raising yeah. money. And the other thing they're doing is having a um, shooting beauty film. <sighs> right. Um, right. And that's Wednesday night at eight o'clock in Mahar Auditorium. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, I think it's 8:30. Is it 8:30? I right. think it's uh, eight o'clock. Well, that's what I have down um, on that. Um, Double check. It's eight or eight thirty in Mahar yeah. Auditorium on campus, and um, that is going to be. Um, I believe it's about shooting uh, a, like a day in the life from the perspective of the disabled person. I think that's right. correct. That, right? I, yeah. Um, People yeah. in wheelchairs using right. cameras is a right. large part of it. Yes. Right. So that I'm, I'm hoping to get to that. And it's it yeah. Wednesday at eight thirty. And it's on the front page of the town website. So. Oh, great. Nice great. job. All right, uh, other questions or comments from Ms. Stein? All right, other liaison reports? Um, I'll just, Hello. nothing yeah. you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to get full credit, so you need to know that I did the walk this way thing again on Saturday <laughs> oh, night. <laughs> so walking around, that and is wonderful. wearing many layers, <laughs> trying to stay warm <laughs> from right, 10 o'clock to about 2 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, well, Saturday was quite a, it was a pretty quiet night, so. Yeah, I was, was going to say, the cold weather is bad for you, but it's good for keeping the cold. It's true, and Saturday was an incredibly busy day with the Extravaganza Festival. Um, all the Greek uh, houses uh, or chapters had formals that night. There was a big concert at Mullen Center. I think people were very occupied or very tired or whatever. Um, so, uh, but it, it went well, and it was the, the best part of it really is about the. Um, the conversations that students were having with each other. So it's a very kind of different experience for me. So I was kind of part of a group that was roaming around all the time, checking on all the other groups. But the, s the groups of students who were having the conversations with each other, um, there were a lot of students going out, not so many coming in, um, but, but even less so of both than the previous week. Um, and the reactions that they're getting from each other. I, and we talk a lot about peer influence and uh, how valuable that is. So. Um, I, I, w I was pretty impressed by it. We didn't, I don't think we diverted anybody to a different route, but we did raise the awareness about um, about being respectful in neighborhoods. So um, that's all I have to report. Uh, okay, so let's do our untimed items and get out. Should we do here. the liquor licenses first while we can still talk? Sorry, I just lost. <laughs> Somehow uh, I managed to lose the emotion sheet. The motion sheet, but I, I won't know what I'm up to if I can't find my own. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I did that. All right, so uh, why not? I think it's actually better to do the uh, the Lincoln Pleasant thing before our brains melt, so <laughs> or melt further. Well, so, yeah, how do you want to do this? Because I didn't expect anyone to be here about this, I didn't expect historical commission to come, I expected it to be an internal discussion. So, I mean, obviously, we're public, but so I don't know what. Oh, so this is a technicality, is right? A historical commission has asked us to do this, so we're doing it. Right. Like, what else is there to need to talk about? So you you had told us you wanted us to do it now, yes, and not wait into the future because it does kick off this whole process of needing to solicit yes um, representatives as as. Uh, mandated by state law from the different boards of professionals. That's the first thing that has to happen. So t if we can do it now, if we establish this district now, then Nate Malloy, senior planner, who does who takes care of these behind the scenes things for us, can, can make those solicitations together with the same ones from the um, North Amherst historic district. So um, okay, is there more to know than that? So we're doing it from timing wise, we're doing it now to, to maximize, to optimize uh, uh, that process. And and because they've asked us to do it, the, the only thing we would do is say no, and that's not really what we do to requests like this. So Mr. Wald. Yeah, that's basically it. And the, the, again, the Dickinson Commission in some sense under state law has the first option of this, but they're meeting on the 29th. So presumably the process could start soon thereafter. So uh, what do you mean they have first option? I mean, I think again, we could, we're back to that state law issue uh, Which is back to why are we doing this? Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. right, so under item three of why are we doing this, don't we have to wait for the Dickinson Local Historic Commission to decide if they want to be the study committee? Well, they've already had a conversation about it. They've said it's too soon for them to serve as the study commission for somebody else because they're still new to this. And they are planning, as far as we know, to vote on the 29th 
to not do this. By us doing this today, yeah. what we're doing is we're taking ourselves out of the process so that we're not holding anything up as right. we get even busier, closer to town meeting. Because they have to vote that. They have to say, nope, that's right. We don't want to be the study committee. We will have, preferably, already tonight, based on this wonderful packet of information Deborah pulled together for me after I sent her all these separate links, um, that we will, we will set up both, yes, we want a study committee, here's the charge of the study committee, then we don't have anything else we have to do for a while because Dickinson has to vote, yeah, we don't want to serve a study committee, it's fine for us if the select board does it, and then immediately Nate can send out that letter soliciting the professionals for both North Amherst and this committee at the same time, get that process going, we have to wait 30 days to hear back from those folks, and then we can actually appoint people. But if we take ourselves, kind of, you know, do our part and then step away, then we're not in the way of making this move along as quickly as it possibly can. Okay, so we're all set to do this. So what would you like? Please come forward and identify yourself. Actually, speak into the microphones and, um, so the people who are still... i that the select board... Um, is you know following the recommendation of the historic commission to form a study committee for the Sunset Pleasant, um, what will hopefully soon be a local historic district. Um, there's a number. I mean, there's a whole group in the Sunset Pleasant neighborhood that um, is very supportive of this and hopes that it can move forward as quickly as possible. And they have actually already solicited, you know, volunteers from the groups that have to be on the study commission. So I don't know if there's a way to bring those names forward to try and expedite the process because we have been told that the um, Dickinson study committee is not going to want to take this on. So the part that's mandated under state law we can't do anything about. So actual, isn't it true that the solicitations need to go to the professional organizations right, of the uh, architect society and whatever they are. So we don't, um, they could they could with tell the architect society. their <laughs> professional. So like the architects so the in the neighborhood that they have to let this society right. It know. doesn't matter if they live in the neighborhood or not. And right, so, I know. So, right, as you know. So the, the individual, right, she says, they tell their professional, hey, I'll do it, and then they can write their name down, and then that'll make it that much faster if they actually <laughs> respond. Because if they respond to us in two days, we can start appointing. If they, But if they don't, we have to wait 30 days for them to respond. Right, they have right of first refusal within 30 yeah. days, uh, basically, for the... Um, right. Okay, so mandated. will um, guidelines be public? I mean, how would we know what the guidelines are for who needs to let who know that they may be interested? It's in the state law. It's okay. in. The I mean, it, it says which organizations are solicited. Okay, we it have talks that. About okay, the society. You have it already. Right. This the is all in the select board's okay. packet yeah. tonight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So our web materials have all this okay. information. So right. I'm just curious. I don't want to take a, you know time. Um, what is kind of the soonest that a committee could be formed if it has to go to the Dickinson and then come back to you? So it's not gonna come back to us. So Dickinson to is gonna do their vote. They're going to punt okay. on this. And so then um, then the vote that we take tonight will take effect. And then does it go back to the local historic district so or it goes to staff? So this is what we were talking about, the letter. So, so what happens next after, so we're gonna do our part now. Uh -huh. Dickinson's gonna vote on the 29th. In theory, the very next day, assuming all the other okay. thousands of things he has right. to do, Nate will send out these solicitation okay. letters. But until he sends them out, the 30-day clock can't Doesn't start. start. Okay. So that's why we're trying to combine the two letters, because we haven't been able to make the time to send out the letter okay. on the North Amherst Study Committee, which we've already yeah. done this part of the process for. Right. And the charge, assuming we vote it tonight, will be mm -hmm. already available online and individual people from all over can go ahead and fill out citizen activity forms. So we would be, so after the, say for example, some of those agencies probably won't respond at all. So we probably will have to run out the clock at 30 days. But then if we have a pool of people to pick from, that'll be great. As, as opposed to sitting here twiddling our thumbs, because I think two people have applied for North Amherst, even though we've known for months that people want to. Okay, that's great. But, and then Nate Malloy is the person that that funnels through. Okay. And then we do the appointments here eventually. Right. right. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for the <laughs> for the rush on that, but all this is also there, and you've seen all of it before. Okay, so Ms. So Stein, I move to that the select board establish a seven-member local historic district study committee for the Lincoln Sunset Air area, parens LHDSC-LSA, 
in parens per chapter 40C of the Massachusetts General Laws for a term to expire June 30th, 2014. S E C O N D. <laughs> Let's what? just prolong <laughs> this. <What>? <laughs> Second. Uh, Further discussion. If oh, anybody I'm asked the question, as someone pointed out earlier, originally on our agenda, it said Lincoln Pleasant. We are calling it Lincoln Sunset. It doesn't matter what we call it, but what matters is that it actually has something to do with the actual National Historic Register District, so that's why it's being called Lincoln Sunset, not Lincoln Pleasant, as you may have seen previous right. references right. to it. Well, it also has a different... Uh, right, that's why it's yeah. not Lincoln Pleasant. Right. We're not calling it that. I know. I move that the select board... Did we vote? Oh. The wording no. is different. Mr. Wall. Oh, I was just going to point out that the wording is different in the title of the motion yeah, and the body. And I think Ms. The Cowboy title of the motion doesn't Sunset matter. Sunset Pleasant, right? So. Yeah. No, it's Lincoln all right, Sunset. All right. I thought I heard Sunset Pleasant, so we should clarify <gasps> that. It doesn't matter. Lincoln but. Sunset. I think it's a different boundary. Shh. Everyone's going to wait to be <laughs> recognized or else we're just <laughs> evolving into madness and it's well, too late are. for that. <laughs> Mr. Wall, do you have a recommendation for how to correct the inconsistency. No, I just, just want to note that the title of the, the, the common heading for the motions is Lincoln Pleasant, and the individual motions themselves are Lincoln Sunset. Okay, and there's a reason for that. So, so you're saying that the appropriate motion is Lincoln Sunset. Uh, yeah. So the appropriate I wrote motion the agenda, who listed. cares what I wrote this on the, the agenda. agenda. <laughs> and the reason, the reason it's like that is because that's what the Historical Commission said. Yeah. We have changed it since then, but it was posted that way, right. so that's why the heading of the motion is yeah, different I just want the motion. Yeah. Okay. All makes sense. And the, your, your larger point is, no matter what we call it, that is not in any way defining the boundaries no. of it. The committee will determine the boundaries Backward. and that they need, to be, uh, they need to have a relationship to the national or some or geographical, some geographical, whatever. Location, okay, right. So this is, so this we've just spent three minutes talking about nothing. Okay, right. But for all people in favor, who were <laughs> unclear, <laughs> <you> vote. <laughs> yes, all in favor. Aye. 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 <laughs> Unanimous. Okay, next. I move that the select board grant the local historic district study committee for the Lincoln Sunset area special municipal s employee status as of April twenty second. 2013. Second. No discussion. All in favor say aye. Miss aye. <laughs> we didn't vote on the charge because Deborah says we don't have to vote on charges. Okay. So good. There we go. So next up. Special licenses. Thank you. I move that the select board approve an extension for a special wine and malt license approved for concessions at the Fine Arts Center, UMass Amherst, Saturday, April 27, 2013 from a 10 p.m. to a 12.30 a.m. closing time, Judith Bardwell, clerk. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license to Elizabeth Bridgewater on behalf of Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity for a fundraiser event on the grounds of Cowles, Coles, I can't even talk anymore, Coles, <laughs> Building Supply, 125 Sunderland Road, North Amherst, on Thursday, May 2nd, 2013, from 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. Second. Further discussion? No in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve special wine and malt license to Danielle Larferriere and Greg Wardlaw on behalf of the Amherst College Catering for a cash bar catered event at the King Dorm Quad at Amherst College on Thursday, May 2nd, 2013, from 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, so two things we just need to make note of is uh, Thursday, we have a joint meeting for all of us who can attend. It's not a requirement, but if you can attend, it's a joint meeting in this room with the Finance Committee for the new uh, updated actuarial study for the OPEB report. And so you should have gotten hard copies of the report if you requested it. So that's in this room, 7 o'clock. If you can't be here, don't worry about it. Someone who's there will report back. Plus, of course, it will be televised. The other thing is um, next Monday, uh, the 29th at 5 o'clock is our coffee hour reception honoring Harrison Gregg. So please be here for that. Spread if the you possibly word. Can be. Uh, that's going to be in the bulletin this week. That is all. Does anybody else have anything that needs to be said before next Monday? No. Mr. I Hayden. move to adjourn. And without objection, this meeting adjourns at 1042. Thank you very much.